Well, as I mentioned in London, I would be your chairman for the conference today. We've got a, an awful lot to get through, and I'd just like to uh, thank Andy for making these fantastic facilities available to us today. That's really wonderful, um, especially the audiovisual material that uh, makes a change from some of our normal performances where you have need a pair of binoculars halfway out the room to see what's there. Hopefully this is big enough for all of us. Um, we were due to be joined today by Lord Randall, our president, um, and unfortunately John's been unwell, uh, but he sends his good wishes. He's very sorry he can't be here today, uh, but he will be watching this uh, remotely, which is good, so if he waves, he'll see you. Um, also, we will be able to um, send a link round to everybody because this uh, conference is being recorded, um, so you'll be able to have a look through. So anybody who's under the burden of keeping notes during the conference, don't worry too much. You can catch up a bit later if you need to do so. Um, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to our first speaker, who many of you know. It's uh, Stuart Pomeroy, who's the uh, managing agent for in Cold Valley Park, and works for Groundwork South, and he'll be taking you through our opening presentation. Stuart. Thanks, Anthony. Technology. There we are. Um, so I'm, I'm Stuart Pomeroy. I'm going to talk to you about what the Colne Valley Park delivers to improve the Greenbelt for the benefit of people and wildlife. Um, and this first uh, presentation is about setting the context, setting the local context, before you hear from other speakers about wild, a wider Greenbelt policy and uh, wider, wider context. So I'm going to talk to you about um, the past, the present and the future of the Colne Valley. Um, so, you know, where have we come from and where are we now? Um, but also particularly, um, where are we going? And the answer to that, well, really, that's to be established where we're going. But, you know, if the Greenbelt in this part of the world is to continue to deliver benefits for people and wildlife, we need, as said on the slide, an imaginative, immediate and tangible step change in how we support, manage and care for this, um, this precious landscape that we, that we have here. So, first stage, where have we come from? Um, Colne Valley Regional Park on the edge of five counties. Um, so there is a real need to work together um, to, to manage this landscape and it was established, the regional park was established by local authorities in the 60s when they had the vision for the area and the need to cooperate across boundaries to deliver for, for, for people. Um, there's lots of key statistics on that slide which I'm not going to read out to you, you can all read yourself as Anthony has said it's, it's perfectly big enough this time. Um, and um, the red box outlines the kind of roles of the, the regional park. Um, so this slide sort of shows you the scale of the Colne Valley Regional Park, the key features, and um, highlights some of, some of its important, but I think, importance. But I think we are quite fortunate to have in such a relatively small area so much, you know, watery landscape, so many green spaces, 13 triple SIs, etc. Sites of special scientific interest. Um, so this is, this is the six objectives of the Colne Valley Regional Park. Everything that um, we do in the park is informed by those six objectives, whether that's the work of Groundwork South, bringing partnerships together, fundraising and developing and delivering projects, or whether it's work that we do to respond to planning applications. And those six objectives have very strong links with the duties that local authorities have under the National Planning Policy Framework to improve the Greenbelt. Um, and uh, again, in this part of the world, I think we should consider that we are fortunate to have a vehicle, if you will, through the Colne Valley Park Trust and through Groundwork, its managing agent, and the other partner organisations to help local authorities deliver on their duties. Um, so I mentioned it was formed by local planning authorities when they had the vision in the 60s. The concept of the Colne Valley Regional Park is now led by the Colne Valley Regional Park Trust, but is supported by over 80 member organisations. And that includes most of the local authorities who had the foresight in the 60s, 
plus many more. It ranges from residence associations that cover just a couple of streets up to the National Trust and, and everything in between. Um, again, I'm not going to read all of those out, but uh, if your organisation is not listed on there, then please talk to me. Um, send me an email or talk to me, talk to me afterwards. Um, so much has been achieved since the formation of the park in the 60s. In the first uh, four or five decades, um, 50 kilometres of new paths, country parks formed. Um, that was when it was local authority led. Um, we're, in, we're now in a position, there is no formal funding mechanism for the park. We, we don't have a levy like the Lee Valley Regional Park. Um, our sister park around London. We don't have government funding like um, AOMBs. The core funding that we do receive is voluntary from some of the local authorities and from our corporate supporters. And we use this core funding not for planting trees or digging ponds. We use it for building partnerships, working up projects and external fundraising and typically up to £10 of projects are delivered every year for every pound of core funding um, that's, that's put into the park. Um, and I'm just going to talk about one of those projects, which was our um, uh, £2.5 million lottery funded project, um, Colm Valley Landscape on the Edge. As we reach the end of this project, I'll take you on a quick tour of what this, that one project has achieved. Um, and this infographic here uh, shows some of the achievements of this project. Um, the infographic, great way to, to present things, otherwise, um, as my colleague who runs this, uh, Debbie Bauman from Roundup South, says it just becomes a list and a long list at uh, that. Um, so I'll, sh I'll show you, you know, to make that real, um, we'll have a look at a few photographs. So one of the highlights was the volunteering program. Um, over the course of the project, 800 volunteers doing everything from administration to pulling Pennywell out of the rivers. Um, they contributed 8,000 hours, which one of my colleagues tells me will, will um, be the equivalent of five full-time workers. Or you could take the train apparently from London to Birmingham 6,000 6, times for that. And I'm going to make no comment about High Speed 2 in London to Birmingham at this point. Um, with the volunteers, it's a two-way relationship and we've held, between us and the other delivery partners, held 72 training sessions including riverfly monitoring and survey for water bowls and, and lots, of, lots of other things. We also had three trainees um, and they contributed hugely to the projects, especially during lockdown. Um, one of them moved on to uh, further education in conservation, one was offered full-time employment with a landscape contractor. Um, uh, and that's the start of a relationship we've built with that landscape contractor um, and uh, that's, that's been really successful. We've put other people from our green teams into employment there as well. Um, sadly, COVID and lockdown got in the way for our third trainee who had to rethink his, um, his, his, his career change. Um, so lots of elements delivered of the project with protecting and preserving habitat. We, we, working with the London Wildlife Trust, Thames Water and others, um, enabled conservation grazing at several sites, um, supported that over, over four summers. Um, there's some before and after photos. Uh, the cows cannot claim credit for removing the um, uh, abandoned dumped vehicles, but they have done um, you know, a lot of, lot of good for, for wildlife on those, on those sites. Um, we've adapted five weirs for fish passage, um, completed design for a sixth and, a help, and have helped renaturalize a section of the, uh, the river ash. Um, uh, I won't dwell on this because I don't want to steal uh, Tim's thunder from the Hearts of Middlesex Wildlife Trust, um, but a, a joint project between the Wildlife Trust and the Colm Valley Fisheries Consultative um, uh, about angling and nature conservation. That's a, a groundbreaking project. You'll hear more about that from from Tim later on today, um, and spreading the word, um, including our uh, walking in the footsteps of an Edwardian book that's recently been, been published. In 1907, a chap called Stephen Springle wrote an amazing book called, uh, called Country Rambles Round Uxbridge. We've revisited those rambles and updated it, and it's, um, you know, we've seen the bits of the landscape that have changed, 
and we've also seen quite an amazing survival of some, some areas of landscape, surprising in some areas as well. Um, so, yes, where are we now? Um, the pictures you've just seen and the pictures on this slide give you a flavour of what the Coen Valley Regional Park does. This is what I want to be doing. This is what I got into countryside management to do. This is what I was doing when I started working in the Coen Valley Regional Park um, about, about 20 years ago. But, there's always a but, um, that good work is frustrated on a daily basis by the effects of what is happening in the Greenbelt and the rural urban fringe. Over the last few years, five to ten or so, um, I've personally been increasingly seeing landscape decline, severe landscape decline in some areas, and it does seem to be um, does seem to be getting worse. Um, there's there's unprecedented development pressure as well. Um, certainly, my experience on the ground is that Greenbelt is losing its way, um, or more specifically, the way it's valued and cared for is not as strong as it was just a few short years ago. So, on to where are we going? Um, so, this, this, these bullet points is, is what the Colne Valley Regional Park is doing. We are grateful for those um, of the core supporters who are maintaining their contributions in this challenging financial climate. Some supporters are increasing. I'm looking at parish and community councils, some of the local authorities as well. Um, you know, and that increase is really helping us in these challenging times. Um, we've used, my colleague Debbie was, was so successful at delivering that lottery project that we delivered all the outputs for less than the money. So we've convinced, we've asked the lottery and they've agreed that we can use some of that on other things. So we're talking about spatial planning, work, a uh, water bird survey that again Tim might touch on later. Um, lessons learned from other areas, other similar landscape partnerships, and a, a more engagement, outreach, and awareness raising with, um, with, with people. We're doing continual fundraising for uh, practical projects to improve the area and engage communities. Um, so we're looking at funding bids to rewild, whatever that means. Rewild is one of those terms that means everything to everybody. But we're looking to rewild um, river valleys. We're looking at green teams that can have two purposes. They can improve the environment and they can improve people's skills, prospects and employability. And that's, that's what links up with the um, landscape contractor I was talking about. Um, we're working with Arup on a bid to... Uh, National Highways for an M25 Habitat Corridor. There's, there's, there's lots of funding applications to improve the environment all, all going in. Um, we will respond to planning applications where resource allows um, to make the case for the countryside to improve design of the developments and mitigation and to try and encourage developers and local authorities to think outside of the red line, outside of the boundary of the, of the site. Um, and this project, this conference itself, is part of our planning to improve the Greenbelt project, um, which project also includes engagement with local authorities about local plans, engagement with national government about national planning policy framework. Um, the project funding for that ends in June. We've got to use that as wisely as we can, and we've got to find, try and find the resource to continue um, that, that, that work. So that's, that's what, what we're doing. Our asks of uh, local authorities and national government. Um, when we talk to MPs and we raise these Greenbelt challenges with MPs, we always get the response about protection. Yes, this needs protection. And yes, it does. We agree. The area, Coal Valley, does need protection. But you could say it's already protected by the Greenbelt policy, but it's not functioning as well as it was um, uh, just a few short years ago. The other point that we make to the, the MPs and others who talk about protection is protection alone will not work. It needs to be underpinned by, it needs to be underpinned by planning. There needs to be a, a, a plan across those, those administrative boundaries. The green infrastructure plan that we've worked on helps with that and I think you'll hear a bit more about that later on today. Um, it needs to be 
underpinned by enforcement. There needs to be resources for the enforcement agencies, the local authorities on the planning side of things, the government agencies for the rivers and the environment. And it needs restoration. We need to underpin protection by restoration of wildlife and, uh, and the landscape. Um, secondly, we, we need, the Cole Valley Regional Park needs, needs an improved status um, in local plans or relating to national policy. Um, and I've also mentioned, you know, comparison to the status of the AOMBs and the Lee Valley Regional Park. Um, we ask local authorities to use their land holdings that they own. There are significant land, areas of land owned by local authorities in this area. We need them to use that in line with the original intentions behind that land acquisition. In most cases, that was in the mid 20th century when the um, concept of the Greenbelt was first being formed. The uh, local authorities have a fantastic opportunity to deliver on the vision and foresight of their, their predecessors. Um, I've already mentioned the increasing, you know, increased and long-term core funding to enable the Cold Valley to, uh, to continue its role as champions of, the, of the, the, this part of the Greenbelt and the Cold Valley to be seen by local authorities as a, as a key delivery partner for getting stuff done in the, in the natural environment. So in summary, um, we're fortunate with the history achievements and delivery vehicle of the Cold Valley that we've got here. We can help local authorities realise the potential of the Greenbelt in this area with over 3 million people within 10 miles. And locally, we need to make the most of this opportunity. So thank you. Um, without further ado, I'd like to call on our next speaker, um, Peter Bishop, Professor of Urban Design at UCL and joint author of Repurposing the Greenbelt in the 21st Century. Peter. Uh, thank you. Uh, Great, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, this talk is based on a book I wrote about three or four years ago about the Greek belt. And, uh, I, was sort of I was motivated to write the book because I was getting very tired of a conversation or debate in society which was, thou shalt not touch the Green Belt is sacred against if you develop 5% of it, we solve the housing crisis. Uh, and it was about as polarised as that, as crude as that. And I became interested in the idea of the relationship between the city and its countryside. And it'll be interesting to explore the genesis of the Green Belt, uh, the way it's infused our culture and our thinking, and then think about whether or not there's a more sophisticated debate that might emerge out of it. Uh, the relationship between the city and the countryside has always been symbiotic. Uh, yeah, the medieval city enclosed by walls, was separated from its countryside. A slightly idealised, because actually outside the city walls there are all sorts of fringe, nefarious activities, uh, but this idea of a stark division between urban and rural was very much a feature of the medieval and uh, Renaissance city. But in particular, uh, with the exception of port cities, that relationship was also about how the countryside related to the city. It grew its food, it provided its water, uh, wood and energy and raw materials for building for the city to trade on. Therefore, that relationship was critical as a single urban-rural ecosystem. Uh, the Industrial Revolution changed all that. Suddenly, the city needn't have a relationship with the countryside. Uh, the Agricultural Revolution had completely changed the countryside, provided a surfeit of labour, uh, provide the raw materials, the city could grow. And as a result of that, 
there became a degree of disquiet around the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century. This idea that in so doing, we'd, we'd lost, yeah, the idea of lost Arcadia. Uh, the city was damaging. The city was eating the countryside. Uh, actually, this image of Arcadia is not a natural landscape. I think arguably the last time we might have had a natural landscape in Britain was around about the middle of the Iron Age. It's been basically shaped by humankind ever since. This idea that somehow the city was evil, satanic, eating the countryside, became the beginnings of a movement around rethinking the relationship between the city and the countryside. Add to that was the condition of the urban poor. And people like Octavia Hill, Ruskin, Elizabeth Fry began to, uh, along with the campaigners around social justice, started to actually form movements to address the conditions of the urban poor and began to sort of think about what kind of reforms were needed, not just in housing and sanitation, but in lifestyles to try and actually produce a far better, uh, healthier, morally uh, better urban population. Uh, and out of that, at the end of the 19th, uh, 19th century, by the middle of the 1890s, through to the first decade of the 20th century, uh, in Britain, at least, the idea of a green belt started to take shape. And this is uh, an early proposal from Lord Meath in 01 and George Pepper in, 20, in 1911. And this was putting a limit around the growth of London. And the, the sort of proto green belts did two things. First of all, they're there to stop and inhibit urban sprawl, stop the city just growing outwards. The city could leap over them. This idea of an urban ring, of a green ring around the urban area, became the genesis of the Green Belt. But with it, and really critically, this idea that the green countryside was for the benefit of the urban population. It was access to the countryside for recreation, for pleasure, for leisure, uh, and for health. And those things were linked together from the early Green Belts right the way through the 1920s and 1930s. And during the 1920s and 1930s, this remarkable program was kicked off, uh, led by people like Unwin, the uh, chief planner for the LFCC in the 1930s, about acquiring a green belt. Now, in the absence of planning, any uh, formal planning system, the only way to safeguard land was to own it. And during the 20s and 30s, an absolutely remarkable program was put in place around land purchases, uh, using things like bequests on the back of death duties, inheritance tax, covenants, and other very creative measures to secure land for public access and public enjoyment around the cities. Uh, for example, I mean, one of the amazing programs was to acquire baronial hunting rights, which could be purchased extremely cheaply, which, posed, which placed a covenant on the land that had to be kept open and some really creative work around things like Ministry of Defence designations for airfields allowed significant amounts of the area around London to actually be acquired permanently as areas of public, for public use, public recreation and public enjoyment. And by 1938, uh, Middlesex, Surrey and Essex alone had acquired 42,000 acres of land, which is still there today, still there for the enjoyment of local and urban population. So this was the, the kind of the proto-green belt before the advent of the Second World War and the Abercrombie Plan. Now the Abercrombie Plan, a yeah, remarkable plan, uh, still referred to uh, a very, very significant planning document today, came up with this idea of four rings around London and consolidated the idea of a green belt uh, far larger than that that could ever be envisaged by people like Pepler and Unwin, but something which was a zone of countryside to stop the outer sprawl of the city. Uh, this is a map of North Holt, uh, a piece of work I did a few years ago. And what's kind of interesting about this for me is that when planning came in, in the 1947 Town and Country Planning Act, and the Green Belt was introduced, it zoned land for the first time. 
What it did, it froze the city. When you look at this, you see these, these bits of city which are never completed. When you look at the urban fringe, it's a, it's a program that was never completed. It's random and it's been frozen in time. And that poses a question about, is this the best way to, for the city edge to work? The answer has to be no. It was never planned, it just happened, and it was frozen. And I'd say the curse of the Town and Country Planning Acts were that they allowed the zoning of land for the first time with statutory backing. Now, what that did was a curse is that you could then zone large areas of land without acquiring them and prohibit development. So planning moved from being a proactive process of attempting to define and purchase and acquire a green belt to freezing that which hadn't yet been developed. And with it, I think the whole political agenda flipped that the green belt post uh, the 1940s ceased to be seen as a resource for the city but became an exclusion of the city as a resource for people fortunate, to love, fortunate enough to live in the more wealthy hinterlands. I think that, for me, is the essential moral problem we have with the Green Belt today. Uh, and this is roughly the Green Belt we have today, this area surrounding London. Uh, it has settlements in it, and it's highly contested. It's highly contested. Uh, because of the overlapping uses, you know, recreation, footpaths, public access, uh, agriculture, which can be incredibly intensive and unbiodiverse, and then the urban fringe. This is a rather flattering picture of the urban fringe. Uh, for your previous lecture, far more realistic pictures of what parts of the urban fringe are like. The urban fringe itself is actually quite an important piece of space. It's where the city and the countryside interacts. And of course, it's the border which you cross in order to access the countryside. Uh, and having said the curse of planning, I think what's happened now is the curse of lack of planning. So I think the devaluation of the town planning system has meant that now development is considered through a process of uh, adversarial local plan inquiries, which is really an argument between developers and people acquiring land and the people trying to stop it. And the result of that is I think we're seeing the erosion of Greenbelt, not in a way that's planned or thought through, but by a process of basic slow erosion and the loss of Greenbelt without any assessment as to how important it might be. And with it comes this idea of this kind of the, the NIMBY. Uh, I just saying over lunch, I've, I've recently become a NIMBY, by the way. Uh, people are saying, no, we shouldn't develop, it, develop this. So people, can be quite sneering about NIMBYism, but when you see what's being built, you have to say, actually, we should all become NIMBYs if that's the future of the urban fringe. We build some of the worst housing, some of the most expensive housing, with the lowest environmental performance of any of our European neighbours. And this is really, you can see, it's housing around developed plots, which are basically farming plots, rather than a coherent planning strategy to strengthen our rural settlements, actually consolidate and think about the relative values of open space for different, different uses. So, critical issues for me. Uh, without a plan, we are just eroding the green belt. Uh, I think that's kind of obvious, we should plan in life. There's no prioritisation between nature, leisure and housing. Nobody's actually taking a step back working out where we should be consolidating nature, where we should be acquiring land for recreation and for access, and where we can and should be developing housing to consolidate existing settlements to make them self-sustaining. Uh, the housing provided does not accord with need. Uh, the idea if you build enough housing, you supply will adjust against demand and price will fall is a degree of economic naivety beyond belief. Uh, and actually, the real housing need is more likely to be inside the city than on the urban fringe, where the jobs and the public transport allows people to actually access leisure and employment educational opportunities. Uh, value uplift accrues to the landowner. If you manage to get your farmland designated for housing, you've hit the lottery jackpot. Uh, the uplift is huge. 
the land then sold on for development is at a, at, is it, as a housing use value. So therefore, it doesn't actually solve the problem of housing costs because the land's taken out with that planning uplift. It's lost. A lot of the housing is invariably low density and therefore car based, like the image I just showed you. And because we're losing the land value uplift as windfall to landowners, we're losing an incredibly valuable resource which could be used to acquire land for leisure, for biodiversity to rewild, for forestry, for a whole series of other uses, which if you had a planned approach, you could start to think about the city and its urban hinterland and its fringe as a single unit which are connected. So, is there an answer? Well, I think there are answers out there if you're prepared to look, look for them. Uh, in Germany, for example, uh, when city authorities designate land for housing uh, and for other development, it's designated at agricultural value, not at presumed use value. Uh, and all they have to do is provide land elsewhere for that agriculture to be, to place, other, to be replaced. In other words, the value uplift is accrued into the development process, not as a windfall. Uh, but in particular, I was very struck by the, the Dutch example. Uh, and in the book I wrote, uh, one of the chapters written by Rob, Rob Rogema, who is a uh, landscape uh, architect, a strategic landscape planner from the University of Groningen uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, we looked at how the Netherlands sees land, sees development. Uh, this is a map of the, the Randstad, a kind of interesting reversal where the green heart is surrounded by the city, as opposed to the city surrounded by green land. But the concept is basically the same. But the Netherlands has also produced a whole series of national long-term plans, one of which is around ecological structures, another one around energy, another one around climate mitigation for the entire city. Now these overlay each other. So what the Dutch are beginning to do is plan their country and their hinterland, their cities, as a single unit. Uh, this is somewhat psychologically easier because the Dutch made their landscape. The Arcadia that preceded this was the North Sea. So if you've manufactured, if you've engineered your landscape, I think you feel you have the right to change it for the future. That's exactly what the Dutch are doing. Uh, and within it, there are areas set aside for intensive agriculture, areas for nature and wildlife. Uh, and what is emerging in Dutch thinking? This idea of layering strategies on top of the landscape. So you've got a, a, a geological layer, you've got an ecological layer, you've got an infrastructure, uh, infrastructure layer, and you've got activities and uses layered on top of that, which might be agriculture, it might be wildlife, it might be energy uh, generation, or it might even be development. So the Dutch are beginning to think of their landscape in deep three-dimensional ways, in a far more sophisticated way than we are in this country. And therefore plans are emerging across the Netherlands, looking very, very long term. Uh, the Netherlands actually has a set of strategies going for 300 years, which if you live in a land liable to flooding because of the increase in sea levels, makes a huge amount of sense. So the Dutch begin to think about the countryside between the city, the countryside, energy production, wind, wind production, farming, agriculture, and then very, very sophisticated long-term strategies to reshape the landscape uh, in line with climate change, allow flooding of river valleys, uh, building our sea defences, reclaiming land. But in particular, thinking about the relationship between the city and what it needs for the countryside, which is not just land to develop on, but in particular, it's water, it's food, it's energy, and it's biomass as a single planning unit. So, how do we apply that to this country? Well, uh, first of all, I think as a planning unit, we need to go regional. Uh, not having a a layer of regional planning in this country is ridiculous, it's absurd. Thinking of London being planned within the London boundary and then Kent, Surrey, Sussex, Boroughs is a nonsense. 
we're now living in an area where infrastructure is, I'd often mention, you know, the environment has to be thought of on a regional basis. And at the same time, the relationship between the countryside and London and metropolitan open land, incredibly important. How do we put those two together? How do we link metropolitan open land with Greenbelt to form seamless networks and webs of space that go into the city and out into the countryside as a single planning unit? Uh, this is a work carried out by uh, the LSC. I don't actually agree with this, by the way. But a proposal there that why don't you just build a single London extension, which is London out towards Stansted. That is the extension. You don't build on the rest of the Green Belt. You build a new piece of city that accommodates urban growth. I don't agree with this, but I think the thinking is actually rather good. And I think it opens up this question about if we are, and if we do need, if we do need to expand the city, how do we do it, where do we do it, and what does it look like? Far more sensible than allowing any number of local planning inquiries to chip away, field at a time, farm at a time, on the basis of who has the most powerful um, set of lawyers in a public inquiry. Uh, another proposal that came from Terry Farrell, uh, this idea of a community parklands, taking the whole of the Thames estuary and seeing it as a landscape plan within which you placed or consolidated settlements to produce a rational network of growth where landscape is a framework that actually holds the whole lot together and guarantees a very, very high quality of life indices. So, conclusions. Let me wrap this up. Uh, the Green Belt is a precious resource. We're stewards. Uh, we're not losing it at a rapid, rap a rapid rate. But in the next 150 years at this rate, it will have gone. 150 years is not a long period. It's not sacrosanct, but it's a landscape that may be enhanced, adapted, and extended in the work. And in the right circumstances, it could provide a spatial framework for development. Now, the key for that is, actually, it can be enhanced. And just leaving Greenbelt as a planning designation is not good enough with the need to improve biodiversity, to uh, protect endangered species, to make sure we've got clean water and energy production, we need to be investing in the countryside and not just leaving it as an area coloured in on a plan where nothing happens except erosion. Uh, second conclusion. Uh, we need to plan the city and its hinterland together. There is sufficient brownfield land in the city for all of urban growth if we are prepared to unlock it, both through restrictions on greenbelt development and incentives. Uh, development of the greenbelt needs to be strategic and it needs to be not just houses and buildings, it's also green space, enhanced green space. Development value should be captured and reinvested. Now you could designate, using primary legislation, the entire greenbelt as a special planning zone where development uplift is captured by an authority and a high percentage reinvested in land acquisition for leisure and biodiversity uh, to actually create a rich green belt and countryside around our cities. And if you did so, you could then acquire and safeguard additional land in a way that's really proactive, which could actually become a very, very rich resource and our gift as a legacy to the next generation in the same way as we've inherited the green belt. So I think there is a plan there. It's about having a plan though. It's as simple as that. It's not about uh, allowing forces, market forces to dictate. It's about proactively planning and making it happen. And the third conclusion was if we can't rise this challenge then we shouldn't do anything and allow the next generation to be more responsible than we are. At least hand them something that they can do something good with that we failed to do. And therefore, if we can't follow a rational way of dealing with the green belt, I think we need to make sure that we don't cause damage. The very least we can do is not cause damage. If we are to preserve these amazing areas, uh, it's like it's Ivanhoe Beacon, uh, for future generations to enjoy, but also see them part of a planned and rational network where the town, the countryside, the city, and rural development all come together 
a dlouho večer. Tak se vlačí. very much, Peter. That was extremely thought-provoking, especially conclusion three. I think that, that, that'll have us all thinking. Um, I'd like to turn now, because time is moving on, uh, to our next speaker. It's Jamie Dean, who's Area Manager and Programme Director for Good Growth by Design at the GLA. And um, I'd like to pass straight over. There will be an opportunity to ask some questions at the end of the first section. We'll be having 15 minutes. And then after our next tranche of speakers, after the comfort break, there'll be a longer question and answer session. So we'll get through the content of each, uh, each session, and then you'll have a chance to ask some questions. Thanks for the instruction. Thanks for the invitation. I'm, I'm, I'm been asked, and I'm going to dig into the City Hall back catalogue and take you through the development of the East London Gr Green Grid, and which became the All London Green Grid. I'm going to highlight the importance of the partnership working that underpins that, um, the idea of a clear vision for uh, green infrastructure and landscape planning and a framework for delivery, all co-developed and co-authored. In many ways, oh, actually, I'll start. You can see that now, can't you? In many ways, the All in the Green Grid has been incredibly successful, although the context has changed in the last 10 years. can act as a catalyst for discussion around today's key topics. I'm not leading on the policy development around Green Belt, obviously I'm from City Hall, I'm, I'm more on the investment side, but obviously the policy remains very much around protection and investment. Um, but I'm, I, I, I'll hope to show you a few of the investments that have been made and supported by City Hall and a few ideas of how the urban fringe is being reinvigorated uh, with, with, with our support. I'm part of the GLA regeneration team, we work on behalf of the Mayor of London as part of the GLA to shape a better city. We collaborate with all London boroughs, Transport for London, and um, a range of par partners. We, we are a unique team with a strong reputation, a good record of achievement, with detailed knowledge of London's places, area strategy, vision setting, capability, design skills, and a web of relationships across the city. We take a place-based approach to our work, uniquely focused on strategy and detail, plans and projects. And this, this drawing's after the Abercrombie work that, that Peter referenced in his work, the expanding of the whole of Greater London. We have firm belief that each and every one of London's over 600 localities and neighbourhoods has within it the ingredients, the ingredients and the resources for inclusive growth, renewal, given the right strategy, given the right support package. We're very much interested in local solutions to local uh, regeneration and uh, renewal and good growth, inclusive growth. So the All London Green Grid, um, and it's, it's, it's that sensibility of a place-based approach. Whilst we're working strategically, we, it's, the, it's very much the work that's done at the local level that informs this, this strategic plan for London's green infrastructure. Uh, it's, it, uh, this, this, is, this is a proposal for an interconnected web of green infrastructure connecting London's green belt to the Thames, utilising the river corridors and the public transport network. I'm just going to go through, touch on some of the drivers. Most of you know all this, but I think it's a good reminder uh, that climate change, London's changing climate um, remains uh, a key driver to, to this work, and it's been very much what's enabled us to un underpin the programme and, and draw in a huge amount of funding. Um, we all know that London will be experiencing warmer, wetter winters and hotter, drier summers, and we need to prepare for more frequent heat waves, floods, and droughts. And a significant proportion of city's transport, health, and emergency services are at flood risk. There's a real social equity issue around this. And of course, the heat island effect um, doesn't help in London, but we're all aware of the, of the effect uh, green space as, as, as an infrastructure and as the services that can provide and ameliorating dealing with the surface water, dealing with overheating can have. And of course, going back a little bit in time, there was very much a focus on East London uh, uh, um, uh, to 
as, a, as an area targeted for the development, there's a big development opportunity there. I think things have sort of, in terms of the strategic view and London plan, things have evolved significantly, significantly since then. But there was very much a, a rationale of, of, uh, to why we were focusing on East London. And of course, it, 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 in order to meet London's the policy directive directions and policy uh, difficulties around um, meeting housing need. But of course, we want not just accommodating housing, we need to accommodate everything else, and we need to accommodate the structures that that sit alongside. Um, and of course, London already has a significant green network. There is a, it's extensive, and it's largely due to many people's heroic efforts and the cautiousness about development extents that has, that has been able to, that than any other kind of grand plan. Um, but whilst there is this abundance of space, it can be fragmented and underutilised. London has um, uh, landscape and urban spaces have always played a key role in its urban development. Tight, continuous urban fabric around extensive green space becoming a blueprint for cities a, a, a across the world. So there's a, there's a tradition of landscape planning that we can draw on. This is the 1975 Greater London Plan, um, looking, you know, um, uh, uh, setting out to address the deficiencies in access to open space. And we really, there's nothing new here really building on this um, tradition of landscape planning. So East London has, has, still has a unique condition following significant economic restructuring and particularly, particularly containerization of the docks. Much of the industry is gone. Many of the places where people live are struggling and isolated from the river and its associated natural landscapes and open spaces. It's a legacy of inaccessible and unwelcoming places and, and, and disruption for local communities, difficult to get anywhere, unloved and ignored green spaces a lot of canalised rivers to allow development. However, within this framework, there are significant habitats and beginnings of renewal, and large natural open landscapes and diverse communities and cultures of place, phenomenal natural landscapes and open spaces, and some of London's top 20 visitor attractions, Greenwich Maritime, of course, you see here. And so all of that is the basis at this time of planning, this is going back, decade or so, uh, or more in fact, all of this with the rich ingredients that could be woven into a vision for what this could all be if it's all brought together and connected. And this, this, is, what the this is the vision for the East London Green Grid. In, in 2007 we published this document, a primer document, uh, in advance of any sort of policy development or investment framework, and this set out a vision for East London's fragmented green infrastructure and how it could be brought together in an interconnected, multifunctional network. A network of interlinked, multi-purpose open spaces with good connections to the areas where people live and work, public transport, the Green Belt and the Thames. And designing and thinking at the landscape scale, making the most of what's there, linking London's fringe to the Thames and the population centres in between, opening up East London's vast and extraordinary natural landscapes to East London residents, new and existing. We're very much working at the river catchment scale as you can see indicated by this diagram. And we set a series of, of objectives strategically, and this brought on board all the key agencies by effectively mirroring all of their objectives, bringing it all together. So bringing the, uh, the London Development Agency together with the Environment Agency, Transport for London, um, so that we could all agree on a common strategy for green infrastructure. We developed more supportive policy at uh, strategic and local levels, so that's working with the London plan team centrally, but also supporting the boroughs to be developing their policy, and that's something that we're continuing to do to today, with uh, new guidance uh, being um, on its way around um, uh, nature recovery areas, for instance. Uh, developed a series of government structures to support organisations like Colm Valley um, and, and, and others across London. And we developed a series of area frameworks at that landscape scale, and funded and drew, and drew in funding on the back of this framework from central government, a series of strategic projects. Here's the strategic framework for East London. Um, and it was, this was also adopted into local planning frameworks across the, uh, many of the 33 uh, of the East London boroughs and ultimately uh, London wide. So bringing disparate, at times, governance arrangements into a more cohesive um, set of partnerships and discussions around the future plans for, for each of these river scale, river catchment landscapes.
landscapes, and then developing area frameworks in collaboration with hundreds of partners, everyone of interest. We prepared six of these area frameworks, each one for, the, for each one of those landscapes at that water catchment scale. And this sets a locally, sub-regionally, set a strategic context, very vivid and graphic area description, accurate and based on the data that was available, and on the back of which a strategic vision was agreed between partners. And this would set out this a series of opportunities at the, at the sort of landscape scale uh, and objectives which clusters of locally produced projects would then go on to deliver. And we would identify these projects with the boroughs and other interested organisations and uh, landscape management organisations, uh, nature conservation groups, etc. And, and, and on the back of this, we were able to access significant funding. Um, and that was the kind of the catalyst for getting everyone around the table to agree on a very particular prescription for investment in, in green infrastructure. And each one of these set out detailed accounts of these projects as part of the bidding strategy. And we were on the back of that, we were able to draw in additional funding <coughs> from central government. There's over 300 projects, 50 different agencies, a first phase of delivery, 100 projects over the first three to five years. Many of these were, went on to be delivered. Um, and they, each, importantly, each one had its own delivery strategy operating within this framework, delivering the vision, but doing that in a very um, independent um, and uh, sustainable way. And as I mentioned, this, uh, you know, by um, this framework, the importance of this framework, which really helped arrange track project funding. Um, I think it's really important when you, when you design it, when you do the drawing, when you package this up, you, you're in a much better position to access low-flying funding, funding that may have been used for other purposes, um, and funding that you wouldn't necessarily think of. So regeneration funding or planning, planning gain funding being used for the, for the for green infrastructure delivery. Can you just take you through one example of a sort of large project that we helped deliver? Uh, this project's like Rain and Marshes, on, right on the sort of the, the very opposite edge of London from where we are right now, um, at the eastern edge, the most extraordinary set of open marshland landscapes, 1,500 acres of a natural environment on London's doorstep. Of course, a lot of it is actually over the border uh, in Essex. Uh, so since the Middle Ages, the marshes have been a constructed landscape of ditches and dikes to support London serving animal husbandry. Recently, recent uses preserved the area and its ecosystem services. Regular overtopping from the Thames kept the area wet. And East London Grid supported a project to manage this water level to help the broader area adapt to climate change and to integrate this unique landscape with its surroundings for the benefit of neighbouring areas and for London as a whole. Levels of water levels are tightly controlled, a tight, now a tidal lock on the river wall. And working back against the traditional sequence of development, i.e. the process of isolating and drying out the land for development. And through the East London Grid, we funded a range of initiatives to protect, enhance and interpret the cultural and natural heritage of the site. We worked with a range of partners to deal with the dislocation between the marshes and the adjacent settlements on its edge. Investing in new gateways and rampways to open up access. Bridges over ditches, protecting the habitats and their ecosystem services while enabling access. Highlighting culturally significant relics in the landscape, delivering educa the educational potential of the site, using in, in this instance using the inside of shipping containers as classrooms and public facilities for bird watching heights, etc. And of course, this, on the back of this uh, success, it was decided to roll this approach out London-wide um, uh, under, under the change of administration took a more London-wide view the Green Grid and similar evidence was brought together and mapping exercises were undertaken to underpin the key strategic um, moves to be highlighted within the framework, access to open space, to nature, again managing climate change, the, the importance of making connections between these fragmented aspects of the landscape highlighting the distinctive de destinations and just highlighting the other ecosystem services that um, all of this represents. And they all learn a green grid following the same principle of interconnected network, utilizing the tributaries of 
the Thames as the main north-south routes with transversal east-west links to, to the Green Belt was published in 2012. And this was also strengthened, support for this was also strengthened within the London Plan, which uh, just slightly previous to that in 2011, with new policies on green infrastructure, <laughs> urban greening. And this is all about, identi and it's very much about uh, the, the, the push then became around identifying and, uh, and support green grid area partnerships. Didn't necessarily need to be called that, there are the people out there that are doing this stuff. It's about getting the support to them that they need. Uh, and putting in place the frameworks and putting in place the governance structures across London. This helped establish green infrastructure terminology, pull together relevant maps and data, areas of efficiency and access to open space, for instance, and had lists of potential projects and priorities. And um, you see Convoy Regional Park there as part of the kind of some of the existing strategic partnership initiatives that we had identified at the time and the, the way in which we were able to put resources into um, joining up some of those conversations at that wider landscape scale in order to facilitate these frameworks. And um, Stuart will remember all of this. This is going back a bit. We haven't seen one of them for a while. It's nice to, it's nice to see uh, some old faces, a few other people I recognise from this process in the audience. So updated and in some instances expanded the original six area frameworks and then introduced another six for London coverage. And it's within this framework, um, we'll be a little out of date now, and we are limbering up to um, consider refreshing this. Of course, there's a lot else happening, local nature, recovery strategies, and rewilding, and all of that kind of, you know, there's a changed context. Um, and a lot of that work needs to unfold before we'll take another look at this. Um, but it's within this that we continue to invest. Um, so uh, not just um, Next conservation, but also sort of straight for some straightforward regen uh, funding, economic development funding, for instance, through the Mayor's Good Growth Fund, uh, we're working with Organic Lee uh, for the Market Garden City project at Hawkwood Nursery in the urban fringes of Walden Forest. And this project aims to create and increase opportunities for local communities to engage in sustainable food growing, food distribution, healthy eating, cooking, and nature connection through volunteering, training, employment, and enterprise. And of course, we were able to, whilst the funding that I administered through my role at City Hall is more, is more about economic development, we were able to invest in the Green Belt and in, and in the wider ecosystem services on the back of uh, uh, an economic rationale. And only because we had this framework in place. And just on uh, a similar project, just on Saturday, the Forge in Haynock Country Park, uh, it's an ancient forest, and just, we contributed significant funding towards a seven million project that's restored the triple SI um, and, and also restored a series of, um, uh, of derelict buildings uh, to create a new visitor centre, the Woodland Trust's first UK visitor centre, and a series of workshops to get economic activity back into the Green Belt. Um, the first two have been let out to some artisan glass blowing uh, collective, and we were there, on, I was there on Saturday with my daughter, and it was fantastic to see these old buildings breathing life back into the, into the Green Belt. But, in addition to this, there's a fantastic new visitor facility and restaurant and, and cafe as well. If you're, in, if you're in the area, it's well worth a, a visit. And just bringing these fantastic 200-year-old buildings back into, back into use. And then also through um, other funds, such as the um, Further Education uh, Capital Fund, we're able to invest in projects like Cable Manor College uh, Mottingham Campus, which is a Effie College focusing on green space uh, from London's, uh, you know, London's only specialist environmental college on an ex-urban green belt site at the edge of Bromley. Um, and, uh, you know, fantastic architecture, fantastic activity being introduced and supported within the, within the green belt with a much wider hinterland and ecosystem hanging in place. So, um, just really, I don't have any great conclusions. I just wanted to show you some, some stuff that we've been working on and, and continue to work on. Just to say that um, we know that the All London Green Grid is due an update and a refresh, as I said. We're very interested to hear how it can be useful to the work that you're trying to do uh, in, in this part of the Green Belt and elsewhere in the Green Belt. Um, there are other things, there are other, uh, there are other supportive instruments that, that have been developed by the London Plan team or the environment team, such as. Um, uh, Green infrastructure is more 
embedded the, the urban green factor in the London plan. There's a whole GI ch chapter now, boosting biodiversity in the London plan. There's the Mayor's transport strategy, significant mode of shift, 80% of all journeys by active travel or public transport by 2041. That's no mean feat, um, and this type of work is all, um, will all be instrumental to that. Um, and, just, and, um, and of course, as I mentioned, my environment colleagues who aren't here to expand upon this, but clearly the imperative for local nature recovery strategies to encourage more coordinated, practical and focused action and investment is now a key focus of our work at City Hall. Um, and this work will be taken forward over the next 18 months. And then we look, you know, I think they're just waiting for a bit more of a steer from DEFRA that there'll be um, more supportive activity for local groups to help take that take up forward. Uh, this, um, I think the response to the climate and ecological emergency uh, the, that imperative is even stronger than it was at the beginning of the East London Green Grid. And there's even more evidence now about the health benefits of green infrastructure, the social justice issue of inequality of access to green space, poor quality green space, etc. Um, so GLA still think there's a benefit to having a London-wide GI strategy. Clearly this needs to be initiated bottom-up with local action as before. Our GLA staff are aware of the need to update the framework and be engaging on its future direction with all interested parties. Crossborough working at the landscape scale, bringing information together in one place can then inform borough or more local GI strategies. And yes, you know, just conclude by saying we're very interested in, in your input on how we um, take the next steps with the, with the refresh of all of this. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Jamie. Um, it's very interesting to see some of the strategic work that's going on. And of course, the reason that we started to say that we were getting increasingly concerned about the Colne Valley is that arguably we believe it's a really good example for a case study because the green belt at this point is so thin. And as you'll see from your packs and those two maps in there showing the amount of pressure that's gradually building up, it's this lack of coordination that causes concern. And We've really got to get our thinking caps on and find the political will to look at what the best thinking is across wider areas than just looking within um, boundaries. Um, I'd like to uh, call on our final speaker for this uh, part of the um, session, um, and it's Mark Job, who's Associate Director and Landscape Lead at Arup. Uh, so I'd like to invite you up, Mark, and he's going to be talking to us about the green infrastructure strategy. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'm a landscape architect um, by background and fiercely passionate about nature-based solutions, not just for the preservation of the planet, but also to create those opportunities for people and nature to integrate properly. Um, my passion is your misfortune today because I'm prone to going on far too long um, in speaking, in presentations. I've kept the slide count really short to make sure that I don't. We'll see how we go. Um, we've heard a little bit about this already today, uh, and I, I did my own sort of bit of sort of digging into it. Um, green belts got a, a long and sort of interesting history from the Eliz Elizabethan age and the, the Queen Elizabeth I in around 1580, a proclamation to now have no new buildings within three miles of the gates of the City of London, um, through to the sort of the mid 19th century proposals for concentric breathing zones uh, around the city. Um, as I mentioned before, in the 1930s, a really sort of forward-looking approach to purchase that land, to form that green belt, um, and actually making that into policy um, in that mid-20th century. Um, a focus here on restricting sprawl, I think, is the sort of the terminology that was used in that 1955 circular uh, that got signed and enshrined in policy. Um, and I think it's interesting to explore a little bit about what the policy was then, uh, what it is now, and perhaps what it needs to be um, going forward. There's certainly been a bit of a terminology change from the 19th century, the uh, open spaces for exercise, um, through to more recent kind of terminology around 
Greenbelt acting as the green lungs for the city. So today, that word kind of urban sprawl is still referenced in detail. We've got the NPPF, National Planning Policy Framework there. Um, protecting those essential characteristics, their openness, their permanence, their presence as a piece of countryside on our doorstep. Um, and also it's reinforced in regional strategies such as the London Plan uh, that proposals that would harm this, this space should be refused. Um, but it's then that you start to get some of those exceptions uh, come in. Uh, and nowadays in, in the NPPF as well, they're quite numerous, uh, unfortunately. Um, building extensions, village infill, redevelopment of previously developed land that may have been developed you know, before kind of policies in place, affordable housing, engineering, transport infrastructure, it's obviously a big one uh, over in this part of the world, um, and renewable energy. These are all specifically set out as potential exceptions to that policy. Um, and it, it's really thinking about that um, and, and how that becomes a potential unplanned redevelopment of our green belt that becomes a, a concern. On to the Corn and Crane. So I was part of the team that helped to deliver the green infrastructure strategy a few years ago. Um, and we took on a, um, a site, a kind of a, an area wider than the Colne Valley Regional Park um, to encompass also the catchment of the River Crane uh, closer into the, the more urban areas of, of London. Um, and apologies in advance, there's lots of uh, quotes in here from uh, many of you who are in the room, I think, today. Um, but you shouldn't be so quoted. Um, the quality of the green infrastructure in this part of the world is really significant. It's stunning and beautiful. Um, it gives us a really excellent foundation um, for a really healthy ecosystem, an ecosystem that's not just for the species that we're trying to protect and we cherish so much, but also those communities that live and work and enjoy this landscape. Um, the area we looked at, 270 square kilometres, it's a sixth of the size of London. It's really huge. And almost half of that space is designated as Greenbelt. Um, it's a hugely valuable resource. Um, I think you quoted uh, John here, um, who's put it in words uh, better than I can. It's a, a surprising survival of, uh, of this really rich landscape on the edge of so many people. It truly is a green lung for, there are 1.6 million people that live within just a 20 minute walk of the over 200 kilometers of, of waterways that are in this landscape. Uh, that would get us to Calais uh, from here. Um, and it's those waterways that create that hugely important unifying link between all of these different landscapes. Um, and that connectivity to that many people um, there's so much research, um, lots of it international, but lots of it in the UK now, about how important that is for our own health and our own well-being. The Forestry Commission quite recently did a, a piece of work that looked into landscapes like this that have got that, those threads of connectivity to where people actually live and work, um, just reducing the sedentary the, the, the population that aren't actively moving, exercising in a significant way, just reducing that element of the population by 1% um, would deliver around £1.5 billion pounds of economic benefits to the UK annually. And it just seems like such a small thing, a small percentage for that amount of benefit, um, that the landscape, you know, a well-designed, connected landscape can deliver so easily. Um, and research across the world has consistently drawn really strong correlations between landscape, quality landscapes, accessible landscapes, and improved mental health, quality of life, um, reducing recovery time from illness, surgery, um, enhancing childhood development, including concentration, improving uh, characteristics of ADHD, and self-discipline. You know, the, the benefits of being able to access and use a really functional, strong landscape are huge and well researched. And the Colne Valley really does provide this. 
Um, it truly is a landscape of health, well-being, and bringing people and communities together. Um, the benefit of being able to exercise within this kind of a landscape, you've got all of those other environmental benefits that this quality of landscape brings, from air quality, water quality, noise attenuation, and actually the act of being able to move and exercise in these kinds of spaces significantly enhances the benefit of that exercise you do. Exercising in a better quality, a visually green environment, improves, improves so many correlations of both the physical and mental well-being of, of those who undertake it. Um, and and, and this, this whole landscape creates a real sense of place for this part of the world. It promotes those communities to be cohesive, to interact and to enjoy their spaces together increases a sense of security and it promotes that awareness of nature um, which is something I've been so passionate about over the years. Um, but as, we, as we've heard um, and we'll continue to hear today, um, it is under threat. Um, at the point of its establishment um, in the mid 20th century, um, really foresighted, you know, a, fa a fantastic initiative to create and designate and, and draw some lines around this, this, uh, the regional park. But at that time, it was already home to the huge reservoirs, um, you know, incredibly important part of our everyday life in London, um, but quite a very sterile boundary and quite a sterile, sterile landscape, potentially. Um, the National Railways, the M4, I think, was in place at the time. Um, and quickly followed by much more infrastructure, notably the M25, uh, and obviously the development of, uh, of Heathrow um, in the um, uh, sort of in the, the post-war era. Um, and today, it's it's his home. You know, it is, has become a kind of an unfortunate home to some really huge projects, some of the biggest development projects in Europe. Obviously, High Speed Two is uh, moving its way through some of the northern parts of the regional park. Um, the potential expansion of, of Heathrow um, and significant amounts of strategic, planned business and home development um, across lots of different parts, both on the edge of London and in the communities further out to the west. And all of this, um, you might be selecting or, or developing some parts of the Green Pelt that are perhaps performing the least in, in some cases. But without the lack of a coherent and fully integrated plan, a lot of this development over all of the years, over the last hundred years, has led to an extremely fragmented landscape. Uh, and as soon as you start to fragment, I think what the Kong Valley has got is a huge number of gems beautiful individual pieces that are accessible to those communities that are close to it and around it, but are increasingly inaccessible between each other for the species, um, that there are so many rare species in this part of London, um, and the communities in terms of a proper regional network of being able to move around uh, in, a, in a green infrastructure system. And this fragmentation means that as a system, as a green infrastructure system, it really starts to underperform. It doesn't realise its full potential. And that's where the green infrastructure strategy was born from. Um, and it defined a simple vision um, for this area. Um, and it, that vision does focus on connectivity. Um, there's always going to be development pressures. Um, and there are already lots of uh, pieces of infrastructure, pieces of development, constraints that we need to live with um, uh, here in the Kong Valley. Um, but if we focus on uh, ensuring that new development uh, has some of these principles, this vision in mind, and retrofitting some of our old development or some of our current development that's already underway um, with the right principles, and we can resolve and improve um, this, uh, this, this, this focus. Um, so it leads to um, defining a, a, a strategy-led approach. And I think um, a strategy is, is so important here. Um, I'm a big believer in strategies which are useful, which are live. Um, we've probably all come across strategies that 
sound exciting and uh, very dynamic um, and then have sat on a shelf and not delivered. Um, and I think one of the main jobs of the strategy is to bring that community together um, to unite the people that want to and can make a difference in an area behind a common vision that everyone signs up to. Because if you create that will, then that strategy is going to remain alive and will begin to get developed step by step or delivered. Um, crucial, particularly in the Con Valley, is working with those high value assets. As I said, there's so many pearls um, in that necklace. Um, they've got to be protected. They've got to be used as models for what you can do elsewhere. And they've got to um, become the kind of the, 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 uh, the driving force of, um, of what of what the, the development that comes that comes forward. Um, connecting these opportunities, regardless of notional or physical boundaries, is so important. You know, it's it's all too easy for a, a linear infrastructure project to define its boundaries and to deliver something along it and call that a mitigation package. Um, but actually, if that ignores the landowners that are either side and perhaps that connectivity that you need across such linear projects then they're failing, in my view. Um, and programming them to make sure that they can happen at the right time in a connected way. We spend so much money on delivering individual projects at much greater expense because of the constraints held by other landowners or other infrastructure providers alongside them. Whereas just thinking and planning that, that project or those collections of projects and giving them a little bit more time and delivering them together as one comprehensive package, um, much cheaper, much more bang for your buck in terms of the value, that the, the uh, ecosystem value that you get from the money that's invested. Um, connected to the, uh, the stakeholders, we've got to link together those people who have the money, have the land, with the people that have got the expertise and the will, the passion, the excitement. Uh, and I think that's the really important job of a strategy and the development of a strategy. We held a number of workshops as part of that strategy. I think it's really important to not meet people on their own to build and garner support. People need to hear each other's views. Um, High Speed 2, Heathrow, National Highways, um, National Grid, they need to hear the views of the Wildlife Trust, the Forestry Commission, the landowners um, and, the, and the Con Valley. Um, they need to come together to sensibly debate um, and agree uh, a, a point to move to. Um, and fundamentally, um, uh, you know, this, the whole point of developing this strategy was to develop and deliver um, on the ground um, a really resilient uh, network of green infrastructure. Um, fundamental to um, any of these strategies is not just uh, uh, the vision and the principles that you might be working to, um, but ensuring that projects that come along respond positively to their context. Um, and mapping and understanding, and I think Jamie um, covered it well in the, uh, in the All London <coughs> Green Grid. The, the, the beauty of the All London Green Grid work is the knowledge of the people that are behind the development of that <coughs> piece of work. Properly ingrained local knowledge that means that solutions that come forward um, with a view to help deliver this vision, uh, these principles, um, still respond to the landscape in which they are designed. Um, you know, there's, there's the, co the character of the, of the coal and crane valleys developed over millennia um, and in more recent years from the farming and flood management um, through to the sort of major infrastructure developments of the 19th, 20th, 21st centuries. Um, that's all defined this place and you need to understand that um, before applying principles of how to, how to take it forward. And this is, this is fundamentally, I think, perhaps for the first time this has become much more ingrained in national policy. Um, it's recognised in the MPPF now as leading with context, as le um, design-led um, solutions and context-led um, design. Um, developing that with the local communities and developing it with that landscape character in mind. Um, essentially creating a series of places that are unique to each other um, but, are young, but are united by an ambitious vision um, to recognise the 
scale, the, the, the scale of the potential that, that there is in this, in this uh, part of London. Um, and then the green infrastructure strategy goes on sort of beyond that to define a series of principles, um, which essentially are all about providing a framework um, from which you can start to judge projects and opportunities that come up. Some of those might be the major development projects that are um, on the fringes and threatening um, the overall uh, character of, of, of this green belt landscape. Um, but they can be looked at within this view um, and the principles can be applied to those projects to make sure that those uh, schemes which may be happening are developed with the right principles in mind. Um, I, as a landscape architect, uh, haven't got a huge kind of breadth of, of influence on, on some of these uh, major development projects and some of these urban development pressures. But what I do have, what I think we all have as kind of green infrastructure and environmental professionals is an ability to teach and influence good design and making sure that when stuff does happen um, within our backyards, to quote the, the sort of the NIMBY reference from before, um, we take a responsibility to not uh, ignore that, um, to not just argue against it, but to find ways to ensure what they do deliver is of a significantly better quality, um, properly contextual um, and properly integrated within the wider landscape, moving beyond those red lines that we see uh, a bit too often. Um, and beyond, um, so this, um, the, the NPPF goes on to talk about Greenbelt in a little bit more of a, a proactive sense, which I think is, is interesting and it's a really important um, aspect that I think needs to become more and more enshrined in, in local policy and ultimately delivery. Um, Greenbelt isn't fine just standing still. The rural, the urban fringe landscapes, they do not need to just be protected. They've got to function really, really strongly um, for themselves, for the, the wildlife, um, but for us as well. Um, and there's so much more that can happen within these green landscapes that can significantly improve their value. Um, a green belt that doesn't just protect this edge of London, um, but defines a sense of place, functions to enhance people's lives while protecting our planet. Um, and as part of this, integrating and challenging those infrastructure and big or small development projects um, to provide benefits at a major scale, not just on a local individual mitigation kind of perspective. Um, Stuart mentioned, uh, I think, a couple of these as we talked about it um, uh, in, in his presentation. The green infrastructure strategy um, has got in the region of sort of, um, well, there are hundreds, in fact, hundreds of individual project opportunities that have been identified. Um, and we've taken some of these on to another level of detail, around about 25 uh, to another level of detail. Um, just a couple of samples here. Uh, the M25 is a corridor, um, humongous potential. There's a really varied landscape along its length, some of which is functioning really high, and there's some really exciting species um, and um, opportunities for people to kind of interact with that in some places. Um, and in others, it's really misconnected, perhaps the intensive agriculture, um, perhaps other forms of infrastructure that come close to it, and you end up with this kind of almost derelict, trapped land. Um, the M25 Habitat Corridor is one of these that we've proposed to um, national highways to explore as something to fund. It could easily be a 25-kilometre significant habitat corridor um, along the M25, uh, connecting over 20 ancient woodland sites, the triple SIs that are along there, uh, that are currently fragmented by the M25 and the M40. Um, woodland opportunities, not just for biodiversity, um, but also to offset carbon emissions. Um, enhancing habitat connectivity, of course. Um, and in this uh, piece alone, we've identified seven specific projects, most of which have already got stakeholder, landowner support uh, in principle, um, uh, totaling over 300 hectares of land. Um, and in doing some of the biodiversity calculations for that, 
looking at least at 12, but some up to 60% uh, increase in biodiversity metrics. So that's a really significant jump in areas of land that are already green, uh, a lot of which are already owned by one landowner. What a dream project. You just have to deal with one landowner. That would be quite nice, wouldn't it? Um, and some of these are just so easy to deliver if you get the people with the vision and the will with the people who have those land and those needs. There are funding mechanisms already in place for most of the infrastructure providers and operators um, to ensure that these sorts of visions can be delivered. Um, and over on the Misbourne, uh, 10 kilometre green corridor um, for people and wildlife. Um, significant opportunity to increase opportunities for walking, cycling and connecting into those national trails that define this landscape so well. Um, reconnecting communities, um, severed from the Con Valley Regional Park by the M25. Um, and uh, along here we've got half a dozen opportunities, um, some of which have got uh, biodiversity gains of up to 100%. The Green Infrastructure Strategy, it's available online. Uh, do take a look, it identifies some next steps, um, and I've summarised these here uh, on the board. Um, critical to prioritise those projects and get delivering. Um, when people don't see delivery starting to happen, that's when these documents end up on the shelf and stay on the shelf. It's got to be de developed and communicated, um, making sure that those successes, those wins, are communicated into the wider community, into the stakeholders, so that it becomes enshrined in that policy. It becomes easy to get people to support these and uh, embed it into policy. Um, find the delivery mechanisms. There's lots of them out there find the funding models, define the options, and create those partnerships uh, to actually deliver those projects on the ground. And critically, look at those early wins and monitor them, properly capture the successes and the failures of those early projects so that the next ones um, can be even more successful. And that's uh, everything for me. Thank you, Mark. I know you've done a, a marvellous condensing job there in the, in the time available, which wasn't very long. Um, we'd like to move now into a, a, a short uh, question and answer session. So if you've got any questions that are arising from any of our previous speakers, um, I will explain how that's done. But if I can invite um, Peter, Stuart, uh, Mark and Jamie up to take a few here in front of the microphones. And I will then endeavour to use this rather strange cue. So let's see if it's, yes, I think it's working. Um, I think the idea was I was supposed to hurl it into the audience and see who grabbed it and spoke, but I don't think that's going to work. Uh, all you have to do, there's no switches to fumble about with, even an idiot like I can use it. So all you have to do is to speak into it. So has anybody got any questions for these? These marvellous ones. I'll put it up here. If you could just tell us who you are and then ask your question. Uh, good afternoon. My name's Jane Hervey and I'm a trustee for the Children's Society. And it's a question um, for, for Peter. I just wondered if you are ever invited to sit on groups where they're looking at future planning. Uh, that's too easy. Uh, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> just trying to elaborate. I mean, no, I mean, I... I uh, no, no, I mean, yeah. Okay, <laughs> short and sweet. Oh, I should have stayed where I was. Pro probably a bit of a statement, gentlemen, really, but um, I think the Cone Valley, I've known for a long time, uh, and I've got to that age where I've been doing conservation work for about 50 years, uh, and I've worked with most of the major conservation organisations. I'm also with the Children's Society, but the two most important things in life are water and oxygen, Without them, we have nothing. I'd just make sure you, all four of you agree with that, right? And to me, the Cone Valley is a network of rivers, um, and quite frankly, they're in a disgusting mess, uh, despite all the great work. And oxygen-wise, it's probably one of the most polluted, sort of what I think as countryside green spaces in the country. So my ask really is, is how do we think present government, uh, be that whatever colour, is going to change that because it has not worked for the last 50 years. They've failed continually, decade after decade after decade. 
Um, I think I was a member of CPRE uh, at the age of about eight years old, and I don't see anything improving for the water or the air in the Cone Valley in that time period. So why, if we have the same government process, do we think we're going to get anything fixed? Plenty to get your teeth into there, gentlemen. Who, who would like to have a stab at that one? I don't really know where to start on that. Um, <laughs> I mean, yes, the rivers are not in a good condition at all at the, at the moment, um, but we do still have this beautiful countryside on the edge of um, London. There are some amazing things in there. We can't not fight for it. We have to keep talking to our politicians, those who will listen to us and those who won't. We've got to keep talking to them. Okay. Um, I think from my perspective... Um, it's our responsibility to make it easier, I think, for people to actually find the project and fund the project. Um, one of the things we've been doing since the green infrastructure strategy was developed um, is rather relentlessly speaking to individual people and companies and infrastructure providers who we know have the funding mechanism to be able to deliver, um, speaking to them beyond their own remit. Um, so that they can become part of a joint collaborative funding to deliver something, particularly rivers, uh, that goes well beyond anybody's individual jurisdiction. You know, the, the, the highways contaminate the, the rivers, the environment agency have got a responsibility there, landowners, Thames water, misconnections, that kind of thing. Um, but when we can bring those people together um, and make it easy for them to say, yes, here's some concept funding, here's some early stage funding, that's when things start to happen. And I think there's been some really good successes around London. Um, there around are no successes because biodiversity continues to be in decline. The water continues to get more polluted. And the air continues to get more polluted. We have Heathrow expansion. We have HS2. We have building. The projects are there, which is great. I haven't heard anything I don't like about the project. But until we have a political structure, and I'm not talking about a party here. Thank you. But can, of course, I, the, whole, the whole point of this, this session is to start talking about these things and to bring together as many people to say precisely what you've said, because we've all realised that we've reached crisis point, and certainly since I've been involved with the Cone Valley for the last five years, I've been shocked at, at how bad the situation's come, and we don't have very long in which to sort it out. I mean, that's the truth of it, uh, and at least there is far more discussion now than there's been for a very long time. I mean, our main problem with the Colne Valley is people know their own little slices of it, but they don't realise it's part of a bigger entity. And the only protection that entity has got is the Green Belt and the will locally within each of the authorities to actually enforce it. But they've got competing challenges of funding and everything else. Something's got to give, and time is running out, so I, I completely sympathise with that view. Can, can, I, sorry, can I come in on that? Because Certainly. So first of all, I totally agree with you. Uh, the planning system is broken. I don't think it is fit for purpose. Uh, and I also agree that things are getting worse. I mean, the deterioration of water quality, the dumping of sewage and farm effluents in rivers, the deterioration and the erosion of biodiversity and the damage to climate, and these are things which are accelerating. The only thing that's consistent with them is the number and the amount of political platitudes that we can do something about it. And I think that, for me, the point you raise is fundamental. Political statements are to a penny. Policy is dead easy to write. But we have something missing. And what we have missing is the mechanism to do something and either, first of all, have regulation with real teeth, which actually stops bad stuff happening and actually penalises. And secondly, proactive planning and development of programmes. We've seen for the last two speakers, actually, two examples in the Coal Valley, the M25, the Green Grid, of mechanisms to do it. But these are... Policymakers do not understand the policy in a vacuum is useless. And I think policy has to be accompanied with proactive programmes which are measured 
and which are effective at addressing the issues the policy is trying to frame. But that's the missing element of this country. We're very bad at it, because actually we are wonderfully liberal and pragmatic as a nation, which means we allow all sorts of things to happen that shouldn't. And we do not have the ability to plan that the Germans and the Dutch and the Scandinavians do, which is a rational, long-term, sensible assessment as to how we deal with issues. Thank you. I'm mindful of time, and I'm going to take an executive decision here, and I think we'll extend this session to, to quarter past, um, and then we'll have a very short comfort break at that point. So this gentleman's been very patiently waiting. If you could tell us who you are, sir, and ask your question. Yes, uh, Richard Knox Johnston, Chair of the London Greenbelt Council. Um, local plans being produced now are not that. They're housing plans, and they're the infrastructure to support those housing plans. There's nothing about planning for the future. And paragraph 154 of the MPPF says the planning system should support the transition to a low carbon future. Now that includes hitting net zero. And yet very few local plans have anything about reducing carbon. This surely provides a very important role for the green belt in the future because the green belt can supply carbon sequestration and resources which are going to be needed to reduce our carbon output. Surely now is the time to cement that in planning law so that the green belt is protected. Thank you. Gentlemen, anybody like to respond to that? Well, I, I could respond to similar way to the last question, yeah. I mean, the, uh, I, the whole lo lo local planning system is driven by housing quotas and housing targets. And at the back of it is a local planning system which allows people to defend uh, historic decisions to acquire land and land bank land. So basically what we have is not a planning of the green belt. We have a mechanism which is almost anti-planning driven by supposed housing need. Uh, and I absolutely agree with what you said in the previous question. Uh, and again, I, what I, I was trying to say is that we need to take a step back uh, talking about being carbon neutral is pointless unless you have a mechanism where you're going to achieve it. And you're going to achieve it by thinking about how the city and the green belt works, not on a year-by-year -year basis, not on a housing quota plan for five years, but a 50, 60, 75, 100-year strategy where we try and optimise our land allocations against the various needs, whether they be for new housing, consolidation of settlements, infrastructure, uh, wind, power generation, solar generation, uh, flood mitigation, whatever. And on a personal basis, I, I moved to uh, Exeter a couple of years ago. I've already become a NIMBY. Uh, I'm already opposing the local plan, not, uh, which is not because I'm against housing, but housing on fields which are <coughs> allocated because people have bought bits of farms which ignore the consolidation of villages that desperately need more population is just stupid. It's as stupid as that. And a lot of the development we are seeing is low density, it's 30, 35 dwellings per hectare. That's car-based development. Now, allowing that on the one hand and preaching about carbon neutral is hypocritical government. Whichever government it is, is hypocritical. Thank you. I think we've got time for one more. That's Head towards you with my cube. Hi there, I'm Nicola Thomas. I'm the partnership manager for the Bucks and Milton Keynes Natural Environment Partnerships. That's the local nature partnership covering the area. Um, we, as, as the local nature partnership, we've been asked to lead on the uh, local nature recovery strategy work on behalf of Bucks and Milton Keynes councils. So I'm interested to understand what your hopes are for the LNRS process um, and in terms of what that can do for the, for the Green Belt and how much, sort of what, what are your hopes for that process in delivering the kind of strategic planning that Peter was saying is lacking on the rural urban fringe? If I could make a very short answer to that, that um, my hope for the local nature recovery strategy is that it truly works and functions on a landscape scale. Um, and that's very difficult 
that's going to be challenging to do. You've got organisations like the Coln Catchment Partnership, the Coln Valley Regional Park that you can work with, but unfortunately the, there are five local nature recovery strategies that cover part of our landscape. There's going to be one for London, one for Buckinghamshire, one for Hearts, one for Berkshire, and who have I forgotten? Surrey, sorry. <laughs> um, and um, it must work on how can, you, how can you do a nature recovery strategy on an administrative boundary basis. It really, mm. We've really, really got to pull out the stops. Sorry, that was a bit of a longer answer than I, than I, than I meant to give. Anyone else? Any final comments? Yeah, I, I, to add from, from my perspective, uh, actually one of my concerns with the whole process, um, we, we've heard about you know, provision of water, provision of food, carbon sequestration. Um, the pressures on the landscape are just as intensive as the pressures on a small little bit of urban realm um, in the heart of the city. Um, the land, uh, what I worry about is policies that are driven um, or, or developed or plans that are developed very solely on a very individual focus, mm. such as nature, for example. It's critical, it's important, but um, for our landscapes to really function, you know, we've got so little landscape left in Britain in comparison to our population density and that population size, our planning needs to consider all of those different ecosystem services and how they interact and how they perform together. And that's the only way that our landscapes can really um, work in, in a positive way. Um, otherwise, we lose food provision. We lose timber um, for, for, for sustainable construction. We lose the ability for, for carbon. And we lose um, the potential, you know, the kind of the landscape character of, of our own individual spaces by developing solely along a focus. And I think we've had that a number of times over the last 60, 70 years. Uh, and, I, and I think it continues to be a bit of a concern. So I think something to think about when in the development of them, how they can be holistic rather than individual. Thank you, Mark. Well, can, I, can, I, can I just make one quick comment? Right. Previous gentleman talked about air and water. Uh, don't misinterpret. The third element has to be money, I'm afraid. Uh, and I think the thing we forget about is, I talk about uh, policy being kind of detached. If you don't own the land, if you don't have the uh, ability to regulate, you need money to intervene. And we have stripped this out, with the exception of road engineers, I think we have almost very, very little money. So I'd say that you, the broad answer to a lot of these questions is you need, first of all, agency. And Jamie's examples in London is a really good example where agency can actually set up proactive plans and programs. You need regulation, and you need somehow to find funding to do it. And the reason why I said we should capture land value up there from the planning gives to landowners is to give ourselves a budget. We need a big budget to stop the, the green belt just standing still, but actually transform it into an amazingly rich resource for everybody, whether you live in it or in the city, and actually think about being able to plan it in a proactive way, that we are just nowhere near without the resources to do it. Thank you. I'm mindful of the fact that the clock's showing 16 minutes past, so we'll have a 10-minute comfort break and then back into here so we can make a prompt start at half past three and we'll be presenting some more uh, speakers for your delectation. Thank you.
Right, welcome back everybody to part two of the, the conference um, and thank you for, for keeping your eye on the clock, that's very good. Um, we're now going to move into the second section which is challenges and opportunities uh, and for the Cold Valley Regional Park and at the national level. And our first speaker is Tim Hill who's the Conservation Manager at uh, Hearts and Middlesex Wildlife Trust. Thank you, Tim. Thank you very much. Uh, can everybody hear me okay up at the back there? All okay, jolly good. Um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my talk is entitled Landscape Scale Approach to Conserving the Nature of the Cold Valley Regional Park. Uh, from my own perspective, uh, I am Conservation Manager with Hearts and Middlesex Wildlife Trust. The Wildlife Trust is one of 47 wildlife charities. We're all independent, coming under the umbrella of the Royal Society of Wildlife Trusts. From my own perspective, I've been working in the Cold Valley now for 19 years, primarily with Stuart, um, looking at how we best protect the valley's wetland habitats, its woodlands, its grasslands, and everything that lives there. So first of all, I just want to make you all aware of uh, this particular document. Um, there's a lot of talk at the moment, quite rightly, about the climate crisis, but we also have a nature crisis. And we know that we have a nature crisis because in 2020, three years ago, almost a day, Hearts and Middlesex Wildlife Trust published this document the State of Nature for Hertfordshire. And this followed hot on the heels of the National State of Nature Report, which was published in 2018. And I want to uh, just give you some headlines from this. I'm going to go a bit old school. Some of you may remember Bob Dylan doing something like this. Uh, but anyway, the State of Nature um, looked at the, the wildlife, the habitats of Hertfordshire, compared 1970 to 2020. So some of us in this room will remember 1970, some won't. Um, so we compared the state of nature in that inter intervening 50 years. We were able to do that because in Hertfordshire we have one of the longest established natural history societies, established in 1875. And volunteer recorders, naturalists have been recording the species and habitats during that time, and as a result of their efforts, we were able to um, validate 7,696 species. We were able to make meaningful decisions about their status because of the information that was available. Here's some bad news, unfortunately. Um, in that 50-year period, 76 species went extinct in Hertfordshire. Uh, that's now gone up to 77 because last year we lost tree sparrows as a breeding species in the county. The last colony just outside St. Albans was lost. So it's happening around us. We have this nature crisis and it's not just in the Amazonian rainforest, it's not just in Southeast Asia. Extinctions are happening here on our doorstep. Alongside the 76 extinctions, we now have 1,446 species which are of conservation concern in Hertfordshire. So these are species that without positive conservation effort are likely to go extinct as well. So how do we tackle that? Well, you've probably heard nationally we're calling for 30% of all land to be for nature by 2030. And uh, the UK government recently signed up to an international agreement to that effect and the first are, are the oceans that were, were looked at. How we do that is a different matter. But more importantly, this afternoon, um, one is a really important uh, number because every one of us in this room has an opportunity to make a difference for nature. And I'm gonna give you some examples of how individuals working together have made a real difference for nature conservation and the wildlife of Culm Valley over the last few years. Starting with a quotation. Uh, the valley is London's kitchen garden, its well, its privy and its workshop, and is treated as everyone's backyard because it lies at everybody's boundary. Today, lorry drivers and commuters cross it and hardly know it's there. The forgotten boundary wiggles forlornly through the centre of the reservoirs and gravel pits along the line of the old riverbed. The land not used for heavy necessities remains damp and derelict, unheeded and ill-kempt. That's a quotation from about 1963. Um, it doesn't apply to the Cung Valley. It was written about the Lee Valley. 
which is the sister regional park to the Colne. But it could easily have been written about the Colne Valley at the same time, and arguably it could be written about the Colne Valley today, because nearly 50, 60 years on, the Colne Valley still is unkempt, and you could argue that it's not cared for as well as it should be. I now want to go on to talk about um, some of the examples of uh, us working together as a collaborative over the last 20 years or so to try and understand the Colne Valley better and use information to inform management decisions. In 2005, just after I joined Hearts and Middlesex Wildlife Trust fr from the Lee Valley Regional Park Authority, where I'd worked for 20 years, we followed on from an example in the Lee Valley to write a fisheries action plan for the whole of the Colne Valley. This was something that the Environment Agency had started some years before. And it was very much a collaboration between the Wildlife Trust, uh, the Regional Park, um, the Environment Agency, and really importantly, the Colne Valley Angling Consultative, as they were at the time, uh, a chap called Mike Halin, who's currently secretary, uh, was very much involved there. And it showed the first example of us coming together to look at the whole of the Colne Valley and start making informed decisions about what should happen where. So very much focused on still waters, but very importantly, it also looked at the Colne itself, which, uh, as you're probably aware, is one of only 200 chalk rivers in the world, so a globally rare habitat, which is essentially the spine of the Colne Valley moving through. Unfortunately, fisheries action plans became less of a flavour of the day and um, the work wasn't followed through at the time. But out of it came a recognition of how important and how numerous the still waters are with the Cumbre Valley. And this map uh, shows you um, some of the water bodies. Um, it highlights individuals, but some of those are made of um, a number of different water bodies. So there's actually many more than 34 listed there, but it gives you an idea of just how significant the open water habitats are within the Calm Valley. And coming back to the State of Nature report, which I mentioned at the beginning, wetlands remain one of our key and priority habitats, and the species that are associated and live within them are a priority for nature conservation. Many of that 1,446 species, which I mentioned, are very uh, important and uh, priorities. <coughs> Based around that, um, we then moved on to 2008. Uh, I mentioned that I'd worked in the regional park, the Lee Valley Regional Park, for, for 20 years. And one of the key pieces of work we did over there just before the millennium was <laughs> to try and understand better uh, the wetlands and the wildlife that was living within, within them. So we commissioned a piece of work looking at every water body in the Lee Valley to count the number of birds that were using them, to assess the ecology, uh, to understand how the whole Lee Valley ecosystem was working. That led to the Lee Valley being designated a special protection area in 2000 by Natural England. So Coming, as I did, to the Calm Valley and the Hearts and Middlesex Wildlife Trust in 2004, felt, well, why shouldn't we do it for the Calm? We didn't have particularly good information about the wetlands, what was using them. So we, we mirrored the piece of work that was done in the Lee Valley. And we commissioned Graham White uh, and Alan Harris. Um, Graham is the, the former head of ecology at the RSPB. Alan Harris is a, is a renowned ornithologist. And they looked at every water body from Rickmansworth through to Denham and using nationally uh, collected wetland bird survey data and dedicated counts themselves, uh, they were able to put together this assessment which was funded by the Environment Agency and in collaboration with, with Natural England. And these are the headlines from this report which was published in 2008. So, um, Long time ago now, but um, it just sums up how important the Colne Valley is. So during that time, the 4,618 birds were the peak number between October 
and March, the major wintering period. And they found that the Culm Valley, all those wetlands, supported nationally significant numbers of gadwall, shoveler, tufted duck, smew, great crested grebe, and cormorant. As I mentioned, they also looked at how each of the water bodies functioned within the Cullen Valley because we wanted to understand what they were used for, when they were used, and uh, which were the most important sites. And it became clear from the work that was done that there were two key refuges within the Cullen Valley. Broadwater Lake, site of special scientific interest, and Stockers Lake, uh, which is a local nature reserve just outside Rickmansworth. And it was these, these two key refuges meant that the rest of the Colne Valley was able to support that number of birds because the birds uh, not only used those two key refuges, I've just marked them on the map for you there, Stockers Lake um, at the top just outside Rickmansworth, and Broadwater Lake, uh, which is just um, north of Denham. Uh, these two very um, diverse habitats not only supported birds using them throughout the year, but they also supported birds perhaps using other water bodies at other times that would seek refuge from those other sites when they were disturbed. So we have a very mobile system going on. So um, Broadwater Lake and Stockers Lake allows birds to use those and then move out into the wider countryside onto other water bodies uh, at certain times of day. So if any of you explore the Chess Valley, for example, uh, you'll probably see little egrets feeding um, within the Chess Valley on the river or the watercourses there. Well, those little egrets which feed in the Chess Valley are dependent on a roost at Broadwater Lake. So they go out during the day, feed on the river, uh, make the most of small fish and vertebrates but they need the quiet solitude of a place like Broadwater Lake to roost overnight uh, where they're not disturbed. So there's this constant movement of birds up and down the Colne Valley and indeed fur further afield across North London. And they do that because of these refuges. Um, our whole world is being squeezed at the moment, as was intimated in the first part of the conference today, and it's more important important than ever that we make space for nature and recognise those really important sites and protect them from disturbance and development. Lots of water bodies and most of those water bodies in the Culm Valley uh, are fished. Uh, angling is a very uh, active uh, recreational um, pursuit in the Culm Valley. And um, when we did the work on that 2005 fisheries action plan, it became clear that we had a whole community working away in the Culm Valley, managing wetlands. And Stuart and I worked for many years uh, looking for an opportunity whereby we could support and help those anglers to perhaps look at their, nature, uh, look at their fisheries as nature reserves, not only where they could fish, but they could also manage the wetland habitats. And it wasn't until 2018 that, thanks to incredible work by Stuart to secure lottery funding, uh, that we were able to get funding for a project whereby we could work closely with the Culm Valley Fisheries Consultative. Uh, Tony Book is in the audience with us this morning, uh, very much a partner in this project just to enable us to support anglers such that they could start um, managing all of those fisheries, all of those, those water bodies I showed you, the 34, in a different way, recognising that each of those fisheries, each of those wetland nature reserves, had a part to play in supporting the wider ecosystem of the Culm Valley. So over the last four years, thanks to lottery funding, um, we, through the Wildlife Trust, have run a project in collaboration with Culm Valley Fisheries Consultative, whereby we offered training in wetland management, fisheries management and managing change to any anglers who would like to take part in that. And I'm delighted to say that over the last four years, 44 anglers have completed five days of training. 
five days. It's a huge commitment um, uh, to learn new skills, new experiences. And uh, each one of those 44 anglers have now taken that training away, and 27 of them have produced fisheries action plans, conservation action plans uh, for their fishery. And 23 of those fisheries have now commenced practical works to increase biodiversity. So it's absolutely wonderful to hear anglers uh, more excited about seeing a water bowl or having kingfishers nesting on their fishery than catching the latest carp. I think that's a, a massive recognition of, of, of this piece of work. Really. And not only that, um, but one of the anglers, Anthony Johns, who fishes, uh, manages Savies Pool just outside Rickmansworth, he was telling me that uh, some of the carp within their fishery um, that had stalled, st stopped growing at about 20 pounds as a result of this more diverse management that they're carrying out. Those fish in a couple of years have put on between five and 11 pounds. So it just goes to show that you get the ecosystem right, you get the aquatic invertebrates, you get everything working. Not only does it be benefit, benefit fishing, but clearly the bats, the birds, and everything else. So a pioneering project and it's something that uh, the Angling Trust are now picking up and hopefully it will be run out nationally. The other part of the lottery funded project was to try and prevent an extinction because water voles from the work um, that we'd done previously and the information that we'd collected, we knew were on the verge of extinction in the Colne Valley. They were pretty much restricted to two sites, to uh, Croxley, right up in the north beyond Rickmansworth, and Frays Farm Meadows, which is the London Wildlife Trust um, south of Denham. And from those two sites, we came up with a vision that we would try to enable them to be able to spread from those sites and, and um, move into the 10 kilometres of River Valley between those two sites. And so, again, thanks to this funding from the lottery, we were able to come up with an action plan for that 10 kilometres, improving the habitats, essentially allowing those water bowls to move out. And much of the work that I'm describing here was, was and will be done by those anglers working on their fisheries, making them better not only for fish, but by the same token, they'll be better for water bowls as well. So essentially it's following the, the, um, the visionary statement by Professor John Lawton in 2010, um, when he did the Making Space for Nature report for the government, uh, that we should be more, bigger, better, and joined up. More habitat, bigger habitat, better management, better managed habitat, and join it all together to allow a resilient ecosystem whereby animals can move through our countryside. So the headlines there, 10 kilometres of river corridor, improved for water bowls now. And you can see the, the markings on that map, um, just where the work is taking place. We've trained 36 people, local people from um, the Cullen Valley, local communities uh, are now all engaged in water bowl conservation and all mink raft monitoring, um, controlling mink because they're the biggest predator uh, of our, our native water bowl. And we gave advice, specific land management advice to 22 different landowners through the Cullen Valley to help them in, in the effort to conserve water bowl. So water voles have declined by 95% nationally in the last 50 years. So I'm confident that as a result of this project now that um, we will retain water voles and they are now spreading into that 10 kilometres throughout the valley. Lastly, I just want to say that uh, with all that's been going on in the Culm Valley over the last uh, 15 years since we did the first assessment, Thanks to the lottery funding, we're able to repeat that survey. And this winter, um, Graham White has been looking again at the Cullen Valley. And these are just some of the headlines from that piece of work that he's found so far. So he's identified that Potchard and Shoveler uh, remain exceeding the national significance and Broadwater Lake remains the key refuge in Cullen Valley. Uh, second second uh, is Stockers Lake. So Colne Valley, it's a regional park, but in my view, and from the work and the information that we've collected, 
uh, it actually has national significance. It's not only a regional park, but nationally important because of those coal and wetlands and the birds that they support. It's also got international significance. Um, the Southwest London Special Protection Area, uh, Southwest London Water Bodies, forms part of the regional park. And I mentioned at the beginning the River Colne itself is a chalk river, so it's one of only 200 chalk rivers in the world, so it elevates it to global significance. It's also a regional park with committed support from a long-standing partnership of local stakeholders, so it's locally important. Everybody that lives within the Colne Valley and is able to access it gets huge benefit from the well-being of walking through uh, a beautiful landscape and also from watching and enjoying the wildlife that's there. Sadly, though, continuing threats to the Culm Valley. We've heard about some of them today. Things like HS2 are, are obvious. Uh, the damage has been done. The damage is probably greater than uh, we were told. You may have seen in the news recently that the Wildlife Trust uh, produced a report, which was released a month or so ago, and it highlights that the damage from HS2 is considerably more than uh, originally thought. But also, one of the biggest challenges we're facing at the moment is that um, the Hillingdon Outdoor Activity Centre, which was uh, had to close because of HS2, um, quite rightly, is, is trying to be relocated. We support that relocation, but currently that proposal is for that to be relocated to Broadwater Lake uh, Triple S site, site of special scientific interest, which is, in our view, completely the wrong place for it, because if it does go there, the disturbance is likely to um, completely negate the function of Broadwater Lake uh, as a refuge. So that's a big concern. It's something that we clearly will need to be fighting over the next uh, few months and, and years. So we need space for nature. I've highlighted today that the Culm Valley is of not only <coughs> regional, local, national, but international significance. But in our world today, I just wanted to finish uh, with a quote from G John Lewis Stemple, who's one of my favorite authors. It's true that every house we build is a mausoleum to the birds and animals that lived here before. Uh, and that goes for every development. It's up to us to recognize and protect the most valuable places such as Broadwater Lake, Stockers Lake in the Culm Valley, and protect them for generations to come. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Tim. <clears throat> That's considerable food for thought there, and it just shows you the, the rich diversity that we've got in the Culm Valley that's still alive and well. And this is what's worth highlighting, which is why we're having these conversations. Um, I'd like to hand over now to Jerry Unsworth, who's the Cold Valley's independent uh, planning consultant, who will take you through some of the specific detail of some of the key issues that are affecting us. Thank you, Jerry. Right, good afternoon, everybody. I think this is going to be a bit of a challenge because I've got speaker notes over there, but I really want to speak here, so. Um, I hope I keep the time I need to. Um, right, I'm going to um, take, take us through uh, really moving into some of the development issues and, and planning issues, but first of all, just to um, remind you of the um, location right on the edge of London and the, uh, we've heard about the river systems and um, if you can see on this uh, map on the left of the screen. Um, this is the whole uh, catchment of the of the Colne, beginning uh, a, a number of the uh, rivers, the chalk streams coming out of the Chilterns, and you can just hopefully see the red line um, uh, in the bottom section where it funnels down and all the rivers meet, uh, basically the Thames uh, around Staines or in Staines. Um, so the Colne Valley Regional Park is is concentrated on that, that confluence, so to speak, of, of the catchment. I'm not going to rehearse any of the um, points that Stuart highlighted, uh, really, apart from just this one thing about it is the first taste of real countryside on the edge of London. And 
that is something I think from the speakers we've heard this morning, you know, it has a really important strategic um, role. And I must admit, it's a role that I, you know, I've not worked in this area greatly until about eight years ago when I started getting involved in HS2 and then after that Heathrow expansion. And I must admit, th those um, projects brought me uh, to appreciate really the work, the great work that the Con Valley Parkinson organisation is doing and all the people who've got sort of environmental backgrounds and really struck home to me that the planning system needs to work to help uh, deliver what they're trying to deliver. And the more we went on, the more I think it became clear that the planning system wasn't really working. Um, the, the, the strategic location, I think it, it's important because it is, you know, the green belt is big and there are lots of emotive, um, lots of emotive talk about the green belt and very strong arguments for um, protecting it, you know, as a sacrosanct uh, area and very strong arguments that it should be built on. And I'm not going to um, pitch in on, on that particular debate other, other than you know, it, it is green belt, and I think the key thing, especially when you're right on the edge of the urban area, is that it is accessible countryside and that it functions as a workable, attractive piece of countryside that people can enjoy. And we're blessed in the outer edge of the green belt to have the Chilton's A and B. But I think it's a very important stepping stone um, because we, we don't want everybody to have to drive out to the the most beautiful parts, they should be able to enjoy the natural environment on their doorstep. Now, we, we've had a little bit of a, I think Mark, uh, Mark earlier gave you uh, quite a bit of the, the Greenbelt policy. I'm not going to rehearse that, but I think it's, it is important to step back and remind ourselves that, you know, it is there to prevent urban sprawl, it's to be kept per permanently open. Um, there are five strategic purposes which everybody locks into when you get a planning debate, but I think uh, they're rather narrow, interestingly, despite having five. Um, it says that you should only change the boundaries of Greenbelt in, in plans, and, and I think the whole intention of that was big change should only happen when plans come along, and you should only have building happening um, in very special circumstances or exceptional circumstances. Now, the exceptional is, uh, I guess most of you probably come across this, it, it is when you're doing plans and you want to allocate land, very special in ad hoc applications. But they're sort of the same, you know, they're, they're, there is an important uh, nuance, but the same thing is it should be happening very rarely. And I think that there are other parts of the NPPF that I do think are often overlooked, and this is one of the clauses in the NPPF, which I'm not going to read it all to you, but it's about compensatory improvements when land is allocated for development. And it's those compensatory improvements to the environmental quality and accessibility of the remaining Greenbelt land. And that, that says to me, you've got to think outside of your site, you've got to think about what is going on, the functioning of the green belt in that area. And um, just too often, I think, you know, we see plans allocating sites, they allocate the site, they justify why they think there's going to be a remaining green belt satisfactory around it, but they don't actually bring forward packages of compensatory improvements. Um, that, that, that's, I think, this is about thinking beyond the site, taking a more strategic view. And we, we've also, I think, got another aspect of uh, policy in the NPPF, which, which is, uh, and we've heard again about this this morning, is green belts are there not just to be a tool for stopping things, but they are for local planning authorities to plan positively, to really improve their beneficial use and you know, look for these opportunities that are outlined here. And what struck me as soon as I started sort of working, you know, I've been working with Greenbelt policy for a few too many years really, but it, it struck me when I came to the Colm Valley Regional Park, this is an organisation that's actually trying to deliver all these things. And then they, 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 they're sort of then, and they're not set up as a planning authority or anything, but they, they, just, they just, you know, 
are not able to deliver these things because the planning system is acting as a block. And I've got to say, uh, I, I started my, my career um, in town and country planning uh, and I do think we now, as a profession, have lost a lot of the countryside of the country planning. So we're, we're tending to, it's about you know, growth, 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 and uh, that has got to happen, but we've got to do it in an integrated way. And I do think you know, that paragraph 145, this essentially is why the Coal Valley Regional Park was established, and we've heard from Mark, Mark uh, about the, the strategy was prepared a few years ago, yeah, this is really why that strategy was, was prepared uh, to deliver against 145. And it is now, uh, and, and I've got to say, it's one of the reasons why the park identified some funding to do what they call the planning to improve the Greenbelt project, was because that 29 strategy, uh, and I hate to say it, um, Mark, wherever he is, um, maybe he's gone, uh, is it's sitting on too many shelves. In fact, it hasn't even reached the shelf of the planning officers dealing with schemes. So it's really got to get um, embedded in, 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 in the work that is going on. So I'm now, I'm now going to just move on to my, I've got three case studies. And the first one is looking at the, the sort of development picture. And th this is a slide uh, that um, you've seen sort of on the screen before, and it's really, yeah, this is uh, not, not far from the, the Con Valley Park that we see now, but it's taking a 2018 baseline and it's actually the picture and the green, the darker green is essentially all green belt. Um, the settlements, as you can see, highlighted. Um, and really from the 1965 um, formation of the park, it's only really the motorway network that has changed. So this is you know, up to 2018, pretty intact as, as, a, as a structure. We then move to look at some of the things that have been happening or get, uh, are proposed. And the first, the first thing is national strategic infrastructure proposals. And HS2 is, is the one that you know, everybody will be aware is under construction. Uh, looks like industrial estates around the, those parts of, well, it is an industrial estate. You know, good parts of that will be restored, but it's a permanent impact on the Coal Valley Regional Park. Um, down, down the south, um, this, this is the footprint of the third runway project um, for Heathrow expansion, and that um, <coughs> is, is a project that is sort of on hold at the moment, but it is still the strategy of the airport, and indeed, more importantly, the government, it is their policy that this in principle should should happen and and this is you know as you can tell from the amount of red and the, the this is this is mapping that's been kindly done by the GIS, GIS team um, uh, at groundwork they, it is to scale uh, and we've got, we've got here about 800 acres in in the Colm Valley Park um, of Greenbelt getting gobbled up uh, in that, and we've got um, about 1,200 acres overall, and that is really strategic. Is it? And you think about that compensatory improvements to the remaining green belt. Um, I think it, it, this is a structural change to the southern southern Col Col Valley. Now, it, the, the park clearly does not want this to happen, but if it is going to come back on the table, I think there's got to be a really wide look about that whole section of the, the park, how it works. What we then do is layer on, uh, and again, these are all to scale. The, the, these are not fanciful uh, ideas. They are all development proposals that have come forward uh, over the last four years or so, and are at different stages of, uh, of the planning process. but. Developers will not invest in this sort of, these proposals. These are, the, the least is hundreds of thousands of pounds being invested in promoting these schemes, uh, and they go into millions as well. Um, and an army of consultants uh, 
all bringing forward very special circumstances or exceptional circumstances. Now, th this is a combination of, um, fortunately, very few schemes that have been approved, um, but there is a whole batch of them being approved at Pinewood, which I'll come on to a little later. Um, some of these are from local planning authorities proposing growth, and others are ad hoc planning applications seeking very special circumstances. I think that the, the thing that has struck us is there is nobody really taking a view as uh, what is going on across the whole Col Valley. Um, and uh, e each one, well, a lot of these, and, and I, I really do um, hear, hear again what was said about, I think it was Peter Bishop saying about the growth around Exeter and just fields being identified. <coughs> I mean, I'm not going to um, name names, but that, that is typical of what we're seeing here. They're just blocks of development, <coughs> plonked, plonked and, and justified. So I, th I think, think uh, well, I'm, gonna, I'm going to come on to the, um, the, the s sort of drill down to some of this, but I think the, the big thing really is that we can't just let these things happen, and some of these are really serious proposals. You know, expansion of slough, um, uh, growth that may not go ahead to meet housing targets and so on, but um, or may may not feature in the next round of plans. But if if there are proposals, it's got to be a real win-win to how the green belt right on the edge of London works. Now, I mentioned that Pinewood um, schemes have been, uh, they, are, they are a group of schemes that have been approved, and we've now ended up, and this is just the headline telling, we're now going to have the largest uh, studio complex, basically, in, 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 the, in the world. Yes, the world. Um, and, yeah, th this, it, it's happened in three stages. It's not, um, you know, it's, it's not something that is, you know, it's, it's very clever the way these things, things happen, but the change is, is really marked. And think back to what the purposes of the Green Belt are and where we are right on the edge of London. So it, it's clear that something, you know, from that 2018 period to where we are now and this, this whole plethora of proposals, something has changed. Um, and... I think it's something that I've had conversations with Stuart about. And Stuart does say, well, wh wh why, why has this happened? And I say, well, I don't know if there's been any, any single thing, but if, if, I, if I try and put my hand on one, or my finger on one thing that really has happened, it's the demise of strategic planning, regional planning, um, cross-border planning. It, it's the whole planning system has gone to you sort yourselves out in your borough, your, your district. Um, and, and the Green Belt, and you've seen the size of the Green Belt, it's a strategic policy. It came out of strategy, and it needs that strategic thinking at each, each stage. And frankly, um, we're not seeing it. So I'm, I'm just going to um, take you on uh, my second case study now. And we're going to look at the southern end of the park, um, coming out from Staines. And you can see, hopefully on the map on the right there, you can just maybe see a green dotted line that, that weaves its way up um, between the reservoirs and then round the top of Raceman Reservoir and then north. That's the Con Valley Way on the Ordnance Survey map. And I'm just going to give you a, a taste of, um, of where we start here. Now, I, know, I knew I'd get this wrong, so... I've got, have I got to go on another one?
I must admit, I was stunned when I came down here. Just out, just north of Staines, go out of Staines. Um, there aren't any planes in the picture here, but Heathrow is, is not very far away at all. And I thought, wow, this is wonderful. You've got the M25 just over to the, to the west. Um, and it, um, it, it, it's, it's really a wonderful experience. Unfortunately, you don't have to move very far from there uh, to have another experience. And th these are all actually photos taken uh, about two weeks ago. <clears throat> and it is, uh, well, we, we heard about the unkempt. Uh, th th this is moving from the, the Staines Moor area, north and then west, around uh, the middle slides, and I think you just make out, it says Heathrow Biodiversity Cyclone Valley is part of the Heathrow Terminal 5 mitigation scheme. Uh, you, you wouldn't particularly want to go there for an enjoyable bit of exercise. Um, and the, the, yeah, the, the, these routes are... And I, I do think that's the thing, that you, you wouldn't want to do them again. Uh, and, and I'm sorry, Stuart, I'd, he always tells me, you must go to the, the beautiful parts of the Con Valley. And there are, the, the sad thing is, and uh, I think it was Mark, Mark Job that, that said, yeah, you've got some real gems, and there was a real gem there. But you, you only have to step a few hundred metres almost, and you, you, you take your life in your hands. But there are, there are some more... Um, the more gems out there, and, and again, this is only a few yards, uh, 100 yards moving, moving across the M25, and some lovely bits, uh, and, and you can, you know, it's great when you actually just get, get in there, but then if you move uh, another, and I'm, I'm not exaggerating this, another couple of hundred metres, and you wouldn't particularly, some, some of this is, uh, picked up on some of the Stuart's slides, but this is literally round the corner. Um, and this is on the Con Valley Way. Now, what, what is it that's actually going on? You know, and, and I think the, the key thing here is that it's, uh, it's back to this thing about quality of connectivity. And I do think there is a real responsibility here to um, care for the environment in an integrated way. Yeah, some of this is planning. It's it goes back to enforcement. You know, this waste waste yard started operating, wasn't enforced against in, against the enforcement officers. Probably far too much to do, but they weren't. Yeah, you know, nobody had an eye on. This is actually strategically important. Therefore, we've got to get a grip on it. Um, the, the, there's obstruction. This sort of connect, connects to how the highways, rights of way people work. Um, it, it's, you know, the solutions here to solve these sorts of problems are really inter-service, interdisciplinary. It involves, you know, clearly landowners, parish councils, um, and the third sector. You know, it, it's people pulling together. But we can't, you know, I just don't think we should tolerate this sort of thing. So... I know that's ended on a little bit of a negative note, but there are some uh, positive things here. And we, you know, it is taking the long-term view. We've got something to really care for. We've got some great hidden rivers, um, which are just behind houses, but in restoration schemes that are coming, uh, coming forward. Uh, these are really big structural restoration schemes, but they tend to have a red line around them. Uh, restoration within their red line but how do they then connect up to uh, adjoining areas? There's some good stuff here. The uh, Winter and Maidenhead, fortunately, uh, after uh, our input into the Waste and Minerals local plan, did include a reference to the Coal Valley Park and to the 2019 strategy. And when an application for another waste transfer station, which we didn't want in the first place, but uh, for some reason they did allocate it, um, we did actually get some mitigation because of the uh, policy hook. Uh, and the Spellthorn local plan, which goes to examination next month, has got a Colm Valley Park policy. And in the um, Arab strategy that uh, Mark talked about earlier, it's got 
a model policy in the back of that, and they're also committed to uh, a green infrastructure supplementary document and, and strategy, which we'll be partnering them on. So I'll just come on then to my <coughs> next um, and la last case study, is to look at, um, at the connectivity issue and a real strategic op opportunity, which um, is, is actually just to the west of here, well, from here, going west. And to um, orientate yourself, uh, I mean, we're, we're, we're just da down in this cor corner here, um, the A4007412, M40, M25, um, and the map on, on the bottom um, needs to say this is all, all green belt apart from you can see you can see E2, that's the Pinewood Studios um, and the adjacent Ivor Heath area. So uh, going to Google Maps, we're down <coughs> in the bottom right hand corner. It actually says main reception, so we're only a, a few metres from that. We've heard uh, I think reference to Black Park um, and adjacent to that Langley Park. These are really regionally significant country parks, wonderful places to get, to get to. You've got one of these really big restoration schemes, New Denham Quarry. Um, if I just go back on that, you can see the quarry, the evidence of the quarrying there. These are large scale areas, huge, the size of uh, large parts of, of Uxbridge to compare it. So the obvious thing I would say, um, you need to connect the urban area to this large piece of countryside that's going to be restored and connect to Black Park and Langley Park. Th this is the scale of the restoration scheme. If you can, um, it, you know, we are talking big pieces of landscape here. So moving on to the development proposals map uh, that uh, I referred to earlier. And there is in, in your pack, there is a slightly more detailed version of this that gives you a bit of, little bit of information on each proposal. The, the P in here is where Pinewood Studio started. Um, the other P's are basically the expansion areas that have been agreed in three chunks. So you can see we're already talking about a very significant scale of development and significant buildings, you know, over 20 metres high, um, multi-storey car parks. It, this is not um, countryside stuff that you'd expect. We've got two large-scale data centre proposals um, in this area. One was at appeal just last month, the public inquiry. We've got a motorway service area proposed in the middle there. And in the local plan, the Chilterns and South Bucks local plan that, that was withdrawn because of duty to operate issues, uh, they allocated a site there um, opposite the, the Heathrow expansion area. So the sum of this, to me, does not add up anywhere near to what the green belt should be about. And go back to this thing about linking up um, where, 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 you know, how, how is the planning authority or how is anybody looking at this in a strategic sense uh, to make the area work? Um, and, and the MSA, interestingly, is sitting right where there is an agricultural accommodation bridge over the motorway, providing the opportunity for um, off-road walking and cycling routes. Because the two main roads that funnel in to um, Ivor Heath from Uxbridge and the M M40, yeah, you would not want to walk or cycle along those. So you've got to look at this piece of countryside between, and it is there's some really nice countryside that actually straddles the M25. And piecing it together, interestingly, there was a project in the Arab strategy, the, the 2019 strategy, which suggested that. Um, so we're waiting to see what weight is going to be given to that because it is a critical thing to take on board. Um, 
and the, the MC001 in there is actually the Ivory Environment Centre, uh, you know, excellent facility. But again, you know, just, just picture this area of restoration, a countryside route linked to the Environment Centre. It, it, it just makes sense. And who owns the land? Um, th th this is a large area of land owned by the council, which actually uh, came about, or came to them, uh, after the war, when the Greenbelt was being conceived. And you know, th this, I think, is an example. You, you know, land ownership is key to delivery. So we're waiting to see. So the, 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 um, the message is really from, the, uh, uh, from this section is we've got major restoration scheme to implement. We've got cross-border opportunities and some real gems uh, to bring together. We've got land, council land ownership that um, should work uh, to our advantage here. Hidden streams and river corridors to open up. There's... Uh, Alderbourne, it's just called Alderbourne, isn't it? River. river. It is a river. It's not just a stream. No. Yeah, but, but the, the Alderbourne there sort of runs through this area and a you know, wonderful potential. And the key thing here is, is it is not too late, um, but my concern is there isn't strategic thinking going on that gives me the confidence. Um, so there's a real wake-up call, and we've got to say, well, where, where next on this? And, and this image is um, computer-generated. My son did it for me, but I think it, 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 it's just to capture that relationship between the city and uh, the countryside adjacent to it. And it's got to be countryside that, that people are able to enjoy. So really, I think... that major developments, there's got to be strategic landscape thinking by the planning authority when these uh, proposals come forward. In a policy sense, they, the authorities need to embody the 2019 strategy and start using that um, now um, because it is, it is something that can be useful in these ad hoc applications, but I'm not seeing enough of that. Um, but it also needs to go into local plan policy and into supplementary planning documents. There are some changes at the national level that need to come forward, which I'll say a little bit more about. And I think just to pick up on what Stuart has, has, has raised, there needs to be some status in the form of a new landscape uh, designation that recognises that it's not just about natural beauty, it's about functioning accessible countryside to the urban areas. And the, we do think, and we've been trying to get government to listen to the Con Valley Park as a case study in how the green belt is working or not working. Now, I, I need to um, race through the last uh, couple of slides because I'm uh, very conscious of, of time now. Uh, there is good work happening at a national level. This is actually out of the Natural England's um, green infrastructure um, framework document, which is actually issued just this year. It says a lot about what we want to see in the Colne Valley, but it's got to be uh, seen in the whole planning approach. I'm not going to give you the, the detail on this um, because of the, the, the time, um, but we need to see a sixth purpose of the Green Belt um, about countryside functioning. Um, there needs to be guidance to authorities about combating urban sprawl. Uh, there needs to be something to highlight to councils about this positive role they have, and there's got to be tightening up um, on exceptional circumstances and the compensatory improvements. But probably most significant, uh, well, it's not most because we've got to see all, all of these things, but there's got to be a workable strategic planning mechanism, something that is just absent at the moment. And there's got to be uh, you know, special circumstances, very special circumstances, it's just become, it's become a game really for developers to um, out, outplay the local authorities and we've got to stand back and really make sure that we, we protect what we've started and don't move to what uh, really is the, um, 
the scenario that, that could easily face us. So I'll just, just end there and um, you know, say that we have something really important, I think, to work to protect and improve. And um, I'm going to leave you, actually, just first of all, with one of the things that came out of Peter Bishop's presentation, which I thought was... Um, it's a good book, by the way, good read. Do, do try and get hold of it. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, depressing in parts, but very interesting in, in depth. Um, I think the one takeaway I had from that was the uh, something has changed, or hasn't it just? Uh, I'd like to call on our next speaker. It's Paul Miner of CPRE's Acting Director of Campaigns and Policy. Thanks very much, Anthony, and uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. <coughs> Great pleasure to be back here in the Cold Valley again. I've been involved in researching Green Belt policy for CPRE for many years, and one of the key things that we, we've done in my time here is that we produced a joint report with Natural England in 2010 called Green Belt's a Greener Future. And as part of the preparatory research for that report, I actually came and gave another talk just up the road from here in, De in Durham at Stuart's invitation. So, um, Great to be back here again. Uh, the, the presentation I'm going to give this afternoon is going to summarise research, research that we've done since that report on, on, uh, on Greenbelt land use, in particular the heritage, nature conservation and community food growing elements, and also show what we think the way forward is in terms of Greenbelt enhancement. And Jerry covered the, uh, the planning policy dimensions very clearly and comprehensively in his talk. I'm going to talk a bit more in my presentation more about the farming policy dimension because from CPRE's perspective we've always seen planning policy as primarily performing the strategic role of keeping land, greenbelt land open and permanently undeveloped, whereas the, because the vast majority of greenbelt land is farmland, the best way to enhance it is actually through farming policy rather than trying to rely on planning gain from development in order to do that. These are where green belts are, and, and in addition, the, the work we've done on green belts has also talked about other land, which is highlighted in yellow on this, which is, which is land on, on the urban fringe of other large towns and cities, which we believe is equally important to enhance, as well as green belts. So cities that don't have green belt, places like Leicester, Peterborough, Hull, Middlesbrough, other places, should, that it's equally important to enhance land around those towns and cities as well as land in the green belts. But in terms of the planning policy as well, we're, we're strong defenders of green belt planning policy and we share the Colne Valley's concerns about the current loopholes that exist in it. And we would also agree that there needs to be stronger strategic planning in future so that green belt changes where they do happen are truly exceptional, kept to a minimum, and also happen in the, in the least damaging locations. But alongside what we're doing on planning policy, we're also campaigning for a 40% increase in hedgerow coverage across England by, by 2050. And uh, again, farming policy is going to be the key lever of achieving that. And also, our green belts too will play an important role. But I think just picking up on the point that Peter Bishop made in his presentation about how we prioritise, I think in future, the, the climate mitigation elements of green belts are going to become increasingly important. And the Natural Capital Committee in, in, a, report so, or in a report some years ago called for a creation of more woodland, uh, nearly a quarter of a million hectares more woodland and wetland in green belt areas. So the, the Colne Valley is an exemplar of, of how green belt will increasingly look in, or should increasingly look in future in terms of wetland coverage. And so to give some of the political context here, the 2019 Conservative Manifesto, which is the, uh, the, the manifesto of the current government, it stated that they, they would 
that they would enhance as well as protect the green belt. So it's important to limit to that. But, but also that there's been authoritative calls for green belt enhancement from other sources too, in particular Dieter Helm, the former chair of the Natural Capital Committee, in his essay on in defence of the green belt. Also Sir John Lawson, who was mentioned by earlier speakers, says that the green belt is an important part, part of our ecological network. The, the picture at the bottom of this slide also shows a place that's that's on the edge of the South East London Green Grid, which Jamie from the GLA picked up on his presentation, is this Beckenham Place Park. It's not Greenbelt, but it is metropolitan open land, so comparable. But what, what I think is really interesting about Beckenham Place Park was that it was recently restored using a, a National Her Lottery Heritage Fund grant. And since that restoration took place, which removed the old golf course, it's seen, it's seen a massive increase in visitor numbers. And it's shown what, what potential public interest there is in land that combines the open access and the heritage in particular because Beckenham Place is also a, a registered or listed park and garden. And, the, and the, again, this is a, an important element of green belts which often isn't understood. It, as well as the nature conservation importance, it's also got a, a, a critical historic environment importance. It contains nearly a quarter of England's historic parks and gardens. There's also a, a recent DEFRA tool that Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs called Orville. It's a database that's available on their website, and uh, so O-R-V-A-L. And so some key findings that have come out of it are, are that four out of the ten most valuable recreation sites in England are at are out there on Greenbelt land, and four out of the seven outside Greater London. So, so, so these sites are Sutton Park it, near Birmingham, Windsor Great Park, which adjoins the Colne Valley area, but also Croxteth Hall near Liverpool and Ashton Court near Bristol. And again, it, sh it shows something that's perhaps not properly understood about about the, the huge intre potential interest that can exist in actually accessing the countryside around towns if it's made accessible and, and promoted. And the, these other figures that we pointed out, the, these are all available in our recent reports. So in last year, the most recent work that we've done on this issue is a report called The Countryside Next Door, which we published last year and which we published with some kind support from Historic England who gave us a grant towards the work. And what this looks at, it was an update of the earlier work we did, looking at the coverage of agri-environment schemes in the Greenbelt. These are schemes that DEFRA and Natural England can cope with landowners under the current rural development programme, so mainly through farming policy. And these are probably the most important in financial terms ways of, in, of enhancing the Greenbelt that we have. And... And what's really noticeable about the analysis that we did was that, was that the amount of land that was, that's covered under agri-environment schemes was already quite low when we first looked at it in 2007. So only about half of Greenbelt land was covered by agri-environment schemes compared to nearly two-thirds of all farmland across England. But by, 20, by 10 years later, the coverage had fallen by nearly half. So... Uh, so again, only about, to only about a quarter of the, of the actual farmed area of, green, of Greenbelt compared to just under half of England's land area. So major concern. He, that there have been some changes to how schemes have operated which explain that, but even so, in, in any terms, there has been a significant drop-off in the amount of land that's been covered. And, uh, and so it, it's important that DEFRA and Natural England do start to prioritise again, looking at getting agreements in greenbelt areas, but also as well that landowners and land, management, land managers in greenbelt areas do come forward and put pressure on DEFRA and Natural England to conclude new agreements with them. You get a similar picture, unsurprisingly, in terms of spend as well. So, again, partly reflecting the, uh, the, the geographical land coverage issue, we're only about 7% of all current act committed agri-environment money is spent on Greenbelt land 
which is, a, again, a concern when you consider that green belts cover 12.5% of England's land area. But also, as well, it's a concern given that, that if we invest in farmland in the green belt, it's land that's the easiest to access for nearly half the country's population. I won't say too much about this. This report is on, is on, our, is on our website. It's some work we did nearly 10 years ago that we worked with the Plunkett Foundation on. It was part of a wider project called Making Local Food Work. But again, it's, it's worth reading in conjunction with the presentation that the GLA gave earlier, where they, where they gave a couple of good practice examples about how you might promote more local food growing and local food enterprises in Greenbelt areas. And, and there are a number of really good examples. It, I mean, although this report was done over 10 years ago, as far as we can tell, all of these businesses are still going and still, and still very active. And, and I think the, uh, what we can draw from that is that, is that they've used food growth, they've been able to develop very strong business models around food growing, in particular through providing education schemes to local schools, uh, also health and wellbeing related benefits such as care farming. So, and they're a mixture of family-owned businesses and cooperatives. So, so there's certainly more that can be done and, and a lot of good practice that can be learned from all of these schemes. We picked up earlier, uh, so in the last question and answer session, there, were, there was some interest in local nature recovery strategies. And I don't know, I just wondered how many of you were aware of DEFRA's statutory guidance that was published last month. Have any of you seen this guidance? Any hands up who people who've seen it? Not very many, actually, at least one, but yeah, not very many. Um, in terms of what we've been talking about today, it's, I would say it's very important to be aware of this guidance because there is specific mention of green belt in it. Um, it derives from the government's environmental improvement plan, so the update to the 25-year environment plan that was published in January. Um, the environmental improvement plan undertook to, to green the green belt as set up in an earlier white paper, the Leveling Up white paper. And it said it would do so by identifying key areas for nature restoration through the rollout of local nature recovery strategies. And the government guidance in turn, par paragraph 82 is the key in the statutory guidance because it says that if a responsible authority has green belts in their area, they should actively seek to target areas that could become of particular importance inside the green belt. And again, this supports the government intention for the Greenbelt to have multiple benefits, including nature recovery and increased public access to nature. So, so th this is perhaps still only a tentative step forward, but it is a step forward. And it's meant to be mentioned before that local nature recovery strategies will generally be done on a county basis, but we're also hoping that in Greater London there would be a, a county, there would be a Greater London-wide nature recovery strategy. But I think what's also important in terms of national policy is that there's also more to come as well because, because with the changeover, because all the while there's a changeover from agri-environment schemes to the new environmental land management system within DEFRA and, and Natural England. And what we also know is that DEFRA is going to bring forward a land use framework later this year to guide how, how ELMS or environmental land management schemes are, are targeted across the country. And this is a really important opportunity for us to get more about Greenbelt Enhancement into national policy guiding land management. So, uh, so there should be a consultation on the land use framework later this year. We're going to respond to it, but I would encourage everyone else here to respond to that consultation as well because, because it, it's the most tangible sign that from government, or it would be the most tangible sign from government yet, that they are actually going to do something meaningful to enhance Ant's Greenbelt land. Um, Jerry covered the point about compensatory improvements to the Greenbelt in his talk, so I wouldn't say too much more about it, but just to add as well that, and Jerry probably would have said more about this if you'd had more time, but there's more about compensatory improvements in the planning practice guidance. You, you have to Google it actually to find it because it's so badly arranged, but if you Google planning practice guidance Greenbelt, there are more details about how compensatory improvements work. 
Jerry was also right to point out as well that they only apply when none's being removed from greenbelt and local plans and not to very special circumstances applications and he's right to point, point out that that's, that's a loophole that needs to be changed as well. The other thing to bear in mind with Elms as well is that the government will change the policy gradually about who is eligible to apply for it and they're actually over time going to make a wider number of farmers and land managers eligible to, to apply for Elms schemes. This could be quite important in areas like the Colne Valley because one of the problems that we've had with agri-environment in the past is that the, is that the, the eligibility criteria has, has often excluded a lot of people in the urban fringe, a lot of landowners, because it, you have to have an agricultural unit over a certain size to be able to apply for our schemes. So ho hopefully over time, with, with changes to the criteria, that, that should allow more land managers and landowners to come forward. So this is just to sum up the propositions that I put forward. Uh, I think in particular it, it, it is important that we're doing more through ELMS to, to get good land management in the green belt than, than is currently being done for agro-environment schemes. And the land use framework is, is possibly the best opportunity we have in the coming couple of years to, to actually get meaningful change in that sense. In the medium to longer term, as other speakers have said, we do need more strategic planning so that the Greenbelt policy has more integrity and teeth than it's had in the past few years. But certainly, again, at the local level, what local authorities can do more of is the kind of good practice that's been talked about by other speakers, but also as well, perhaps thinking more about food policies in their local plans as well, so they encourage more locally sourced food in the Greenbelt and... and encourage the, viab the business viability of farm businesses to do good quality farming, nature friendly farming and, and also encourage the public to, to link in their minds the benefits of having the green belt with their everyday lives. Also as well as other speakers have pointed out, we could, I think as well the government should also be looking at, at, put it, at making the Lee Valley Regional Park model more widely applied so that and <coughs> And the potential opportunity for this is coming through the levelling up and regeneration bill because through that it will be a lot e it's probably going to be easier for local authorities to produce supplementary plans and so potentially in future there could be more of a role for supplementary plans to give weight to the kind of landscape strategies that the, that the Colne Valley is looking to pu push forward. So, uh, so I hope that was useful. The, the other thing, to, the final thing to bear in mind as well is that the uh, our our local group in London is also involved in a tree planting project in the Green Belt as well. They're working with the Greater London Authority on that. So it's mainly within Greater London, but they're, they're still looking to investigate areas where they can do more of this work. So I would encourage people to get in touch with them if, if they're interested in finding out more about this project. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Paul. I'd just like to introduce our final speaker, who is Mark Brown, who's a digital and AI business strategy consultant. If I speak into here, can you hear me? Any better? How about, how about this one here? Oh, OK. Now I know. Uh, hello. Um, I'll be brief. So I'm here as a local resident, but I wear two hats. Uh, my day job is not to do with landscape. I'm in agile software development and artificial intelligence, mostly making teams much more effective at innovating and making new products quickly, self-sustaining around human-centred design. I'll talk about what that means and what I think that means for the Greenbelt. Recently, I moved to Denham, uh, Denham Village in particular, and this poster from the Edwardian period when uh, the pre-Greenbelt London Arcadia was popular with tram goers and suburban rail travellers uh, actually includes where I, where I now live. Denham is probably the epicentre of what we've been talking about today, bounded closely by the North Orbital, the A40, the Mainline Railway, the Grand Union Canal, now HS2, at some more distance, the M40 and the M25, 
and uh, on uh, Jerry's map, the um, Anupam Mission Temple development, most of the actual realized development is very close around Denham and specifically near Denham Village. Having moved here, I had to make a very distinct choice, which was given that I have a young family, what am I going to do? And I think to answer some of the questions from some of the folks in the audience, I have already given up on central government being of any help whatsoever. Right, so it starts as a pessimist. That, that ship's well gone, and honestly, I think we're waiting till the cows come home. Um, my experience is as grounded as anybody's experience in, in what I've come across. I just want to make one important point about today, which is that I would thoroughly agree with almost all of the viewpoints, uh, policy frameworks, um, and initiatives discussed by our extraordinary high quality panel of speakers. However, the words human centered design, the words people, the words personal experience, the words action, specific improvement, have not had, I think, a single mention all day. And I think that's candidly shocking. Specifically, I'd like to point to something that I experienced when I lived in a place called Ham, which lies between Kingston and Richmond upon Thames. Uh, this was some years ago when my family was even younger. And it had a, a project under the Thames Landscape Strategy that, uh, a bit like CBRP, benefited from lottery and local government money. A lot of money was spent, including on things that, that frankly were very expensive, paving. We've all seen those schemes. The most successful return on investment projects were, as the image on the right-hand side here, this is Ham Avenues, leading from Ham Common to Ham House, and then to the Ham Riverside, which you can see on the left-hand side of the real rewilding logo image. So this is the view from Richmond Hill. It's extraordinary because actually it's a very densely built urban area with some exceptions. You're basically in the middle of a, a, an urban mass. You have airplanes going over the top. You're on the tube line, you're on the rail line. There's almost nothing that isn't happening here, albeit Richmond Park abuts the area. And what's extraordinary is that despite that, a series of very high quality walks, views, engagements with the landscapes were achieved. And most of those at relatively low cost with very little or no central government policy input. So this was back in the early noughties to early teens of this century. Right? And inevitably, having seen that and experienced that, I walked these paths regularly at the time, cycled them, pushed a buggy on them, walked a dog on them, joined people who were riding horses on them, uh, and enjoyed fairly mitigated traffic movement at the same time. Having experienced all of that, I have very little patience with top-down centralised planning initiatives. So uh, in the Denham area, there are a number of challenges that, that one had to decide one was going to take on and be involved with on a community basis before arriving. We've spoken about the poor quality of some of the public footpath access across the area. We've spoken about graffiti. Uh, and one of the general issues, and this is a generic image, it is a lack of thought through user design. You know, can you push a buggy? If you're movement impaired, can you get along that path? Can you cycle easily and move your cycle up and down levels and around places? So the, the area between Uxbridge and Denham was one of the most popular routes of the early 20th century, uh, even with its own rail line at one point. Very easily accessible, and that's degraded over the century. And in perspective, the post-war planning environment has never succeeded. It's been a failure since the end of the Second World War. It's not that it's failed recently. It never worked in the first place. And to be quite clear about, uh, I think Peter put it very well, a lot of the improvements uh, to the local environment and the real green belt, if you like, were interventions by private and public landowners and associations to purchase areas and make changes. Very interesting to see now the uh, Highways England strategy um, in the next plan to 2025 for improving verges that Mark Job spoke about, right along highways and what have you. That's work that was largely done by private beautification trusts in the early 20th century, which is why things like the North Orbital look attractive. That was, none of that was public. I mean, it was public in the sense of great and good and folks and associations, but it wasn't public in the sense of state. It was more of an Anthony Giddens public in the sense of a third way. We had enabling organisations, and they demanded things of the state, but it was not central government activity. So we have these very specific pressures that have been spoken about, obviously HS2, Crossrail, the Elizabeth Line, and the other developments in the area. And they're particularly worrying, really, uh, about this point around compensation. So, so I think the ship sails on most of these. They are happening. There's nothing else to be done. And that might, in due, due course, although I'm a it, uh, be included for Heathrow's um, third runway. 
One of the shocking things is that if you look at um, assessments of public sentiment over the last five years, the importance of the natural environment, climate change, quality of water, quality of air, connection to green space, all become much more important personally and politically to the population. And the commercial sector, you know, London is awash with public realm spaces that are endless little lawns and expensive trees and nice walks and what have you. Green corridors are really being established, uh, as, as was mentioned. And office space increasingly has outside terraces, large opening windows, more indoor planting. So the commercial sphere, which you might expect to need heavy regulation as a laggard, has actually done a reasonably good job of trying, at least in a tokenistic way, to address these, whereas our public policies move very slowly. There are exceptions to these, but most of these exceptions, in my experience, come from uh, often partly government-funded, but normally at least at arm's length, right, or uh, citizen movement groups. N uh, National Park City Scheme is one of them that's globalised, and London's a key hub for that. New London Architecture is a classic incubator for different architecture and design ideas, more of a media company that's a, a lobbying group. These are... I would assume, relatively important inputs for GLA and their strategy. There's a lot, a lot of noise around this at the minute, and I suppose it's mainly good noise. You've got things like the People's Plan for Nature, and RSPB is heavily involved in that, which would be relevant, where they're effectively trying to crowdsource um, enthusiasm and interest from the population in terms of what people would like to do next. Friends of the Earth have done a lot around access to green space, and the ONS, under that pressure, developed a whole load of data sets. The National Trust has developed the new Eight Hills Regional Park south of Birmingham, and organisations like West Midlands National Park Lab are attempting to throw out blueprints, not just for one green belt, but for green belts and regional parks in general. The problem, I think, with all of this is that whereas it's technocratically very solid and very helpful, it doesn't actually push to action. This is a classic piece from the Civil Engineer uh, magazine and online blog. Right? So we've got the classic policy down piece, so we've got policy and spatial planning, layer spatial planning, hybrid approaches, oh, and then organisations might need to change, oh, and then there are people. And people are always at the bottom of these things, by the way. They're always last, right? It's very interesting. It should be the other way around. So there's this problem that there's this sort of massive backlog, and if we've ever been involved in organisations, businesses, universities, clubs, what have you, if you get very large amounts of strategic planning, with very little doing to test. Do people actually want a coffee on that bench? Do they want a footbridge over there? Do they need that verge? The actual meta picture becomes entirely divorced from a reality. Either in terms of prioritization, if we're very unlucky in terms of missing the things that really matter and that we can afford. So in the world of tech, which is why I'm partly qualified to speak to you briefly about this, uh, probably about 20 years ago, the major shift in technology was that computing became cheaper, hence AI. Google and a whole lot of things today, and therefore you could make things very quickly. The constraint was not the technology. The constraint was your ability to work cross-functionally with other people. Who's your user? Who's your owner? Who's the person behind the counter or helping that person out? Who are your business partners? Can you get very small teams of people together to actually do and test things before you scale them? And this is the story of Silicon Valley, which obviously is rather discredited to date. But it's also the story of the open source software revolution globally and a lot of social change. And simply this notion of the minimum viable product, a thin slice. We could build lots of strategy, lots of policy, lots of regulation, lots of area plans, and then start putting a spade in the ground, only to discover that the things we most valued are not properly reflected through the whole. So it would be an absolute mantra for the world's leading, uh, not just these days, private sector tech firms, but militaries, etc., to deal with a thin slice through to actually trying something out early. It's not a proof of concept. It's actually trying something out that iterates back to what happens to strategy. And typically, there are three components to this. Design thinking, starting with humans. Unless you're asking, is there a person moving through a landscape? What are they feeling, experiencing, doing? It doesn't really have value. Secondly, there's a lean piece of testing which says, if we're going to build 500 footpaths, let's build one in the place that's easiest to do, stroke, has the most appeal to people. And if no one uses it, the other 499 don't need to be built. And lastly, agile, building the, building the thing right, which is to say, look, if we need the landowner, then we actually need the landowner. They need to be, or their designate needs to be in the team. We don't need to talk to all these people. 
we actually need to normally groups of five are mathematically the danger number in any product development. Across financial services, airlines, supermarkets, all of those things, websites, government initiatives, local and central government. If you have more than five people, the communication breaks apart. So if you have a small group of people who are empowered, who have budget, who are self-sustaining, they can execute. And that's normally critical to achieving something that works. Mainly because, although your users are very close, what you typically have is two or three different organizations. And you need to work across all of those at once with enough governance in the team that they can do what they want to do, at least on that small scale. The problem is that coordinating very large bodies and accepting a plan on, say, the box or national scale is a very onerous, serious predicament. It should take years. And most of this requires action in less than a year time frame. Looking at examples of where this works, you might think, wow, this is a rum set of examples. Famously, Spotify, the music app that's the global leader, does this as something that is now commonly misdescribed as the Spotify model. Very small teams of people who do the infrastructure, the back-end development, the front-end development, the user experience, the design, talking to clients. Very small teams own entire features on their own. And a few quite junior people release something new, which is very expensive and takes a long time to come up with as that small team, with total autonomy. And then they'll have to fix it and deal with it. And when it's ready, it can be scaled. In the UK, relatively small organisations like Auto Trader or FTSE 250 business, buy used cars, you would have used it. That organises in the same way. You've got a few hundred people on one floor in Manchester and they run the whole thing. And this isn't Google. I mean, this is real world stuff dealing with actual physical products. Right, in massive volume. And then lastly, just to show it's spatially relevant, Gojek, which is the Indonesian market leader, which was Uber on mopeds, then decided actually it was a spatial planning company and just let its teams do anything they wanted in data investigation and to try to launch new products. Had to go through legal, but young people can launch new products. So Gojek was Uber on moped, you hop on the back, you traffic in Jakarta, you don't get stopped, you hold on to the driver. In the end, it turned out the driver wanted to be paid in cash. And it also turned out that ATMs are very unreliable in Jakarta. So now the driver became an ATM. You pay the driver in cash, he stops and gives it to someone else, and they ledger and pay it on their phone. And then he became the person who brought the hairdresser to your house, and so on and so on. It's a series of patterns and data done by a small firm with very low capital that's now Southeast Asia's market leader. And before we think, well, this is great, this is all tech, this isn't relevant to the third sector or government, there are, there are of course, parts of it in UK uh, civic culture. The government digital service, which was famously launched uh, after Martha Lane Fox took um, the cabinet office to account just over a decade ago, has changed a lot about how government digital services are delivered and the quality of them. Agile movements like One Team Gov, which is a cross-central and local government movement for working at policy and implementation at the same time, using the agile principles I've mentioned, is gaining scale in central government in the UK. And lastly, books like Citizens, in this case by a chap called John Alexander, are obviously uh, gaining more traction as people talk about the importance of having citizen involvement. So there's a difference between an agile team and user involvement, but the two normally go together to produce very good outcomes. Specifically, funding-wise, and I'm someone who's worked for central government, regional government, large global corporations, local corporations in the tech and business development area, for, in my view, the relevant capital model is what's called venture philanthropy. So we were asked about, where's the money? Right? You've got water, air, and money. Where's the money? One of the big problems with the, the case study approach that we're really trying to get grounded in, I think, for CVRP, is that it's just one park. If you go to central government and you say, this is one park, we deserve lots of love, lots of focus, lots of money, it's going to be very hard to justify in the corridors in Whitehall. If you say, ah, oh, this is an exemplar, it's not just a case study. It's an example that's sought through. And the way we do this will have adaptive elements that can be used in other geographies or other regions or other green belts. Then suddenly it becomes much more valuable and much more easy to justify. And the venture philanthropy approach, which I won't necessarily credit or discredit, coming mainly out of the United States, now growing in the United Kingdom, commonly used by uh, less popular capital structures such as private equity, right, to justify uh, the large profits they make, is an approach to investing in social outcomes, so social enterprises or charities, where you take over the investment stream and you demand iteration for the social good outcomes that those bodies claim to create. And then you demand better value for money, and then you fund it and scale it, and you demand they find ways to fund themselves from diverse sources 
so they're sustainable, and then you release them. It's effectively the third sector version of private equity investing. And it's been very powerful in the United States. Obviously, the famous folks like Warren Buffett and uh, uh, you know, Bill Gates and others use models similar to this in terms of achieving many of their aims. And I think on a micro-citizen scale, it's very relevant to the United Kingdom, specifically for us, to England and Wales, because it's a very fractured landscape. And I think the, the key bit there is that uh, there's often this problem with a large mapping and policy exercise rather than exemplary projects. Uh, the High Line in New York is mainly inst instantly recognisable to, to a large swathe of metropolitan Britain. It's a relatively small project. It didn't have a massive budget for the impact it achieved, and yet it's known globally. And it's very hard to think about a London or Greenbelt equivalent which should have the same cachet. And it's very hard to justify why well, we haven't been able to execute something like this. It didn't require a several hundred million pound garden bridge. It didn't require something very in tray. It requires design quality, heavy focus on individual instances. And my hope is that around the Denim area, around the CVRP, we'll be able to pick out some exemplar projects and effectively ask and demand from our local, regional, and central government and other funders that they put their back into helping us achieve them. And thereby, putting the flesh on the bones of the very good policy framework work that has emerged and the public support for that over, say, the last five years. Thank you very much indeed for bearing with me. Well, we thank you very much, Mark. We uh, slipped a little bit on time, but we are going to um, devote a little time to some questions. I should be back with my performing cube in a moment. If I could ask the remaining speakers to uh, take a seat on the panel and uh, we'll open the floor immediately. Right, well that was quite a second half. I know there was a, a very varied uh, amount of content there to consider and a lot of interesting new thought. Um, does anybody have any questions they'd like to kick off with? Say who you are. And Thank you. Hello, I'm Anne Biggs. I'm from Spelthorne Borough Council, um, but I'd also like to say a few words on behalf of the Heathrow Strategic Planning Group. Uh, I'm the chair of the spatial planning subgroup. Um, Jerry will know me uh, and some others in the room as well who are also members of the group. Um, so we are a group of around 13 local authorities and bodies uh, working across um, what's in effect the functional um, economic market area around Heathrow Airport. So obviously that does include a large part of uh, the Kong Valley Park as well. So we work collaboratively on all aspects of the airport that affect our communities, such as noise, air, surface access, uh, the economy and the environment. In 2019, we produced a joint spatial planning framework responding to the third runway proposals at the time, and we're now updating uh, with a refresh uh, for the optimised two runway expansion proposals. As part of this, we're looking to address climate change, decarbonisation and biodiversity, and we have been awarded funding for a net zero pioneer places project that's looking to solutions to non-technical challenges to decarbonising our region and the airport. So we've heard a lot today about the importance of a strategic approach to Greenbelt, and our HSPG group does provide a place where we can work together across this complex geography, uh, across various boundaries, including the London borders. Our experience in discussions as a group is that Greenbelt often becomes the elephant in the room for joint working and a lack of political will to talk about Greenbelt on a wider regional basis. That said, it's our belief that focusing on enhancing public access and natural green and blue networks does give us the opportunity to open the debate. Thank you. Right, does anybody have a question? <laughs> Hello. Um, Andy Smith, uh, CPRE and London Greenbelt Council. Um, uh, Jerry, in your um, presentation, I was interested that you highlighted the expansion of Pinewood Studios, film studios, um, as one of the significant sort of development blots, as it were, on the Colne Valley Regional Park. Something we've been looking at ourselves is 
a, a, a plethora of, of development applications, planning applications uh, for TV and film studio developments. Um, at present, we estimate there are over 30 planning applications or proposals currently um, in the mill for, for all sorts of TV and film studios. Now, whereas Pinewood is an established film studio that's expanded far beyond, the great majority of these applications are from property developers. They are purely speculative developments. And this is on, in a grid one band to the west of London, but going around the Cone Valley um, Regional Park, so top bit of Surrey, round through Berkshire, Buckinghamshire, and into Hertfordshire. It's, and they're all piecemeal. There is no connection between these developments. And I think, you know, come, my question really is, in the absence of any statutory planning for things like this, how on earth do we meet the challenge of all these piecemeal speculative property developments of this kind? Jerry? Well, just in a procedural um, sense, that I think one of the problems is this is just down to each individual authority to reach that judgment our very special circumstances apply. And I, yeah, this is why I think that the, the, you know, if the system is going to stay broadly as it is, then the government needs to give some messages uh, about how very special circumstances um, need to be interpreted to avoid the urban sprawl that, that the Greenbelt policy is saying should not be happening. Um, so I, 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 yeah, I, I mean, it, the problem is we're at the behest of each local authority to reach that, that judgment. And I, I think what, um, yeah, and that, and that will always and correctly stay with the local authority, but it's why there needs to be some strategic mechanism, I think, that is, um, I, I would say, yeah, you need, you, need, you know, and, and it's not only film studios, lots of, you know, data centres, all sorts of other, um, categories of development that, uh, and housing is the obvious one, that you say, well, yeah, there is a pressure in the southeast for these things, and we should not let them happen through very special circumstances. There's got to be a, a stand back and look at how you meet that sort of need and where. Um, and the key thing, you know, and it's not our job to um, make that balance argument, but if these things are going to go ahead, I think the absolute critical thing is that if they are happening in the green belt, then in, in a sense the function of the countryside comes first, and these developments work around that to deliver it, um, because it's uh, you know the worst thing, which unfortunately I think is what we've started to see happen at Pinewood, is is that it's it's like we've got very special circumstances. Yes, we'll mitigate to individual little, um, well, I say little, whether it's you know, the, the, the biodiversity offset or, or the landscape. You know, you can't you know, plant a load of trees to hide the 20-odd metre high buildings. It's the wrong approach. Um, so, yeah, uh, I know what I'd like to see, but uh, it, does, it does start with government policy, I think. All right. Any more for any more? Resist the temptation to throw it. <laughs> Sorry, thank you very much. It's like being in the theatre, isn't it? There we go. Tell us your name. <laughs> Hi, thank you, gents. Very informative and interesting. Um, my name's Anne Marie Vladar. I'm a local parish councillor in Chalfont St Peter. Got lots going on, but I just had a, um, a question for Tim regarding the birds' uh, broadwater lake and. Um, Thames Water and the impact um, that that's having currently. Um, I've been watching their, their new maps, the EDM maps that uh, <coughs> monitors how much uh, sewage that they're putting into the system and it's huge. Um, I don't know whether, do you monitor that? Do you get involved with that? Do Thames Water hide or do we hold them to account? How do we uh, pressure them? They're doing it currently at um, the Jarris Cross treatment works and they're dumping straight into the River Misbourne, which is low flow, and it drops straight into Higher Denham, which 
takes it straight to Denham Country Park, a gentleman in Denham, um, Maple Cross, uh, Maple Lodge, not fit for tr purposes, uh, you know, capacity and everything. I just want to know how that impacts on those birds and the rest of us, really. <laughs> right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's a national issue at the moment, um, uh, all over the news, and our, our colleague Fergal Sharkey is, is headlining the, the, the calls to try and clean it up. Um, as far as the birds are concerned, um, the, the still waters that I described in my presentation this afternoon, few of those are linked to um, the rivers or, or streams, so that pollution shouldn't be affecting them. Um, they're normally they're groundwater or spring water fed, um, so they are separate issues. Clearly, there are other pollutants uh, we need to con concern ourselves about, but it's not you know it's not just the, the <coughs> sewage that's going into there. There's, there's micro pollutants, all sorts of things. Uh, we've got Tony Booker in the audience this afternoon, who's um, uh, leading on on some of that work through the Cumberland Valley Fisheries Consultative. Um, so they're all impacts on our environment and uh, the, the, the sewage pollution from those works um, being discharged into the rivers is a massive concern and everything that comes, comes out with them. Um, like all the other things we're talking about this, this afternoon, it can be tackled, uh, it can be regulated, uh, the Environment a Agency rec needs sufficient resources and sufficient power. And the person that could do that is the Prime Minister. Uh, if he really wanted to clean up our waterways, um, he could do it. He would give the resources and the power to the people who could do it um, you know, almost overnight. <laughs> it, it could be done. Uh, it, it's the will of the government to make that happen is the most important thing. So um, you know, there's lots of criticism thrown at various quarters uh, at the moment, but we should all look to our leaders to sort this problem out, uh, and it could be done uh, with, with the will. Thanks, Tim. Time for one final question. Has anybody got one? Can't quite reach from up there. Oh. Uh... You have the all. Thank you. Uh, Graham Shaw, the Ricelip Residents Association. I also have the privilege to serve as the chair of the Ricelip Woods National Nature Reserve Management Advisory Group. About 18 months ago, there was a lot of talk about wild belts coming out of the Gove Department of the Environment. Is that all now dead? Because wild belts were meant to have better protection than green belts. Um, I, I'll kick this off, but I think uh, it was a Wildlife Trust-led initiative, but for me, the, I like the idea of wild belts, but I think my question was, we already have green belt that has written prote protection, so solving one problem by creating a new designation, for me, I, I was struggling with how that was, how that was going to work. I think the the wording of the premise behind it was all very good and what was different what was different being more positive about wild belts was that there was something about restoration in there so it did have that element of getting things better and improving things yes. um, as for where it, where current government thinking is on on wild belts <laughs> and whether they're going to take that forward or anything else forward i think a lot of things are being considered at the moment, and a lot of representations have been made by a lot of organisations which the government is considering where they are and what they're going to do. I'm afraid I, I, I don't know unless anyone else has some more intelligence on that. I think we just have to wait for the decisions, but a lot of stuff has gone in there and is being mulled over in government at the moment. I think as we've been discussing this afternoon, anything, any new designation is only as good as the power to protect those designations, whatever that comes up. And clearly we've seen lots of failings this afternoon in the discussions in terms of protection of, of those designations. So I think from my perspective, you know, it, it's really getting better at protecting what we have and, and fine-tuning it to make sure that those protected areas are properly protected. 
be the green belt, be it sites of special scientific interest, be it local nature reserves. We need the information, the up-to-date information, uh, if it's, for example, a, a nature-designated site, such that uh, that can be properly protected. Um, it's, it, yeah, it's all down to the right protection. And uh, if these things are put in place, local authorities and those people who have the power to do that, um, having the resources to make it happen, really. And the Broadwater Lake um, situation, which is um, you know, here now in the Culm Valley, um, that's been promoted by a uh, local authority at the moment. Yet it's a nationally important site um, designated years ago on account of those nationally important sites. So that's disappointing that um, a site within the regional park has been promoted uh, for a project that could lead to um, the uh, failure of the features for which that's designated. So these sorts of things happening all the time around us, um, rather than perhaps thinking of, of other ways to protect it, we should be thinking about how we better protect what we have already and recognising that um, such that we're not losing things day by day. Thank you, Tim. I think the, the other thing I would suggest that you do is that we all continue to ask questions and you may want to write to your MP and ask him about that very question of the wild belts um, because he may actually be able to give you an answer. Um, we've run out of time, I'm afraid. Um, I'd just like to thank Brunel yet again for uh, allowing us to host this conference. I do hope that everybody's found it of use and that it's given you a better understanding of some of the issues that are here. I know a lot of you are only too familiar with them already. Um, but I think we all need to remember to keep in touch and to talk to each other. And that is right across the spectrum because what needs to happen now is, is a lot of very careful, joined up thinking. Easy to say, almost impossible to do, it seems. Um, thank you all very much for coming. You will be sent a link to a feedback form. We'd be very grateful if you could give us your feedback and stay in touch. Thank you very much.